Okay. Missing is now live stream on Facebook. That's where we are. Welcome to the Facebook family as well. I'm going to quickly copy the um, the streaming, uh, the live stream, the Facebook live stream. I'm going to send it to the group right now on the chat. So if you know anyone who wants to come in but cannot because now we're at 100, please make sure that you um, send them this particular Facebook link. Now, Ashley, uh, Kosi, as well as Uliander, I think you're all here, and Noma Kladiso as well, Lisa and Melissa. Guys, help me out with the distribution of this uh, Facebook link everywhere and take it up from there. All right, we're good to go. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to thank you this afternoon for the opportunity of salvation and the gift to come to you gathered here to speak about sensitive issues that affect us as young people, as young adults, as old people. And as we delve into such a topic, please bless our speaker, Zolani, your son, as he speaks about experiences, lessons learned, more importantly, how you saved him from the situation that he was in. Bless us also, we may learn and understand. It's a sensitive topic, Lord, so we pray, pray for grace, we pray for forgiveness, we pray for mercy, we pray for understanding, we pray, Lord, that we may learn and when you do come, because you will come, remember our names, those that are here on Zoom and those that are on Facebook, those that will watch now and those that will watch later. Bless us all abundantly in your name, Jesus. We always pray. Amen. And that's an amen and an amen. All right, good. So first thing first, I'm going to give over to the announcements of the day. Immediately after the announcement, I'll introduce our speaker. He's already here. And then from there on, we can start to have our lesson. After the lesson is done, he's going to do his presentation about 20, 25 minutes. And then from there on, we should be able to start interacting within ourselves. I'm telling you, it's an exciting program that we're having today. The speaker is excited. We are also excited, but we're so more eager to learn, particularly to improve in our spiritual lives. So here are the announcements of the day. So welcome to 230 Conversations. If it's your first time here, welcome to this platform. It's been here for over a year. Since the pandemic started, we have been here. We've done a lot of programs, uh, things that we talk about to do with uh, uh, the life of a young person, the things that are emotional, the things that are spiritual, things that are physical, everything mental, everything financial, the holistic person, if you want to put it across. So 230 Conversations is all about facilitation, discussion, and thought, a Christian platform for young people and young adults, old people, whoever can, uh, you know, uh, interact with us on this platform, you are still allowed to come through. We are on Facebook. This is our page, 230 Conversations on Facebook. So please do check our page, like our page. That's where we post our advertisements, our videos at times. We're going to be starting to live stream soon enough on this Facebook page. Currently, we're live streaming on our parent page, which is FDA underscore advertise. But do check us out on uh, Facebook. You'll find us through. All right. This is our mother. The mother is FDA underscore advertise. You will find a lot of advertisements to do with FDA programs happening in the world of South Africa and even beyond, okay? So you can go and like that page, follow it as well. We're interested in knowing what's coming up, what's going on, who's who, who's preaching what way, who's teaching what, and all these kind of things. That's the page to go to. This page is also on Instagram. You'll find it there. It's got a lot of followers. These are the old numbers that we have. So please do follow and like that page as well. FDA underscore advertise on Instagram. Check this out. If you do, by any chance, want to advertise on this particular page, contact the people there, contact the administrators there. You've got a program coming up, you've got a wedding uh, coming up, put it there. You've got a church program, put it there. We are definitely going to support you in the best way possible. FDA underscore advertise. We are on YouTube. Now, listen up. Every single lesson that we have, we download it from our Facebook page and upload it onto our YouTube page. So the YouTube page is 230 Conversations SDA. By all means, please do make sure that you are subscribed to it. You'll find all the videos that we did a long time ago, powerful speakers from all over the world coming through to 2.30. So please go and check out the old, old videos. Even this one that we're doing today, we'll upload it by the end of the day. So please do check it out, 230 conversations on, uh, on YouTube. Okay, this is our child. This child is known as the 9.30 Sabbath School lesson. Every Sabbath, 
half past nine in the morning, South African time, half past nine in the morning, we have a lesson. By the way, we've started off our new quarterly, and the new quarterly uh, has the first title as living in a 24-hour seven society. This is what we're discussing today. It was Ashley teaching it today in the morning. Next week is going to be me, and then Miranda the other week as well. So please do attend this 9.30 lesson on our Sabbath, 9.30 to 10.30. Please do attend that as well. Today, the man of the hour is here, O Brother Zolani Mbunche, to take us through love, marriage, and divorce, a man's perspective. Now, we need to be sensitive about this whole thing. We've been talking to him, and he has agreed. This is a very sensitive issue. There's a lot at stake here. And, and he has agreed and said, you know what, he will pull through. He was telling us about the number of calls that he got during the week when people are asking, are you really sure? We want to talk about the family members, former family members, and everybody else from churches everywhere, Asking him, are you sure you want to speak about such a sensitive issue? And yes, he will, from a man's perspective. God bless him, will come through right now. Next week, we're talking about the same concept, but this time from a woman's perspective. Love, marriage, and divorce, a woman's perspective. Usis Musimo Happy is already, I think she's here on the platform as well. She just sent her, her campaign video or her advertisement video, and we're posting it on our social media platforms where she was telling us about how to attend and all that. So we're having it on the 10th of July, Love, Marriage, and Divorce, a woman's perspective. So here we go. More things to do with marriage. Submission in marriage, Umam no Kanyo, the biblical narrative and modern trends. Does it make sense to submit? And who is submitting? Does money, culture, religion play a role in who will submit or who will not submit? Is that a weakness? Come through and learn through as we come on the 17th of July. 24, love in marriage, the most violent act. To speak about sensitive things again, to speak about violence in marriage, physical abuse, emotional abuse, or forms of abuse in a typical marriage situation from one who's a survivor who went through all this, Mariette Tabonga Mlambo, taking us through on the 24th, the last Sabbath of July. Everything beautiful about marriage. Couple goals, the joys of marriage. Ruth and Valentine Zinumwe, taking us through such a beautiful topic as we wait for the last Sabbath of July. Now, we're all picked up for August, for September, and also we're now picking up with October. So this is what we're having for August. It's Women's Month in South Africa, uplifting our beautiful women that we have, and what a lineup we have. On the first week of August, why am I an Adventist? Usamu Kasa, taking us through that beautiful topic. Now, the other ones are still praying for their topics, but here are the speakers coming through. On the 14th of August, Bukhebendalo, taking us through a topic, it's written TBA to be announced, not yet coming through. Bukhebendalo, we can't wait to see you on the 14th of August. 21st, it's all about women, not pure Baloli, taking us through another topic coming through, it's just praying for it, praying about it. And then on the 4th of September, we're getting into a month of theology. And what are we starting off with? How are we saved from Dr. Admiral Nube taking into scripture as to how truly are we saved? What are the science of the mechanics of our salvation? Take us up with Ukruzo on the 11th of September. We men and we men, manhood from the biblical lenses. Again, we talk about theology, but this time in the aspect of manhood day. Then on the 16th, on the 18th rather of September, Oh, Pastor Kaya Mieza coming through with the essence of giving. That's what's coming through on the 18th of September day. Guess what we're talking about on the 25th of September? The church and sexuality. Arthur Smanda taking us through such a beautiful topic, the church and sexuality. Okay, fine. Now, next week's 9.30 lesson in the morning at 9.30, our Sabbath school lesson, Restless and Rebellious. That's our lesson. Do read the content, please. You can download it from, I think it's ssnet.org uh, or just simply Google it, Sabbath School Adult Lesson. You should be able to get it. You can download it. If you can't, then we'll put our numbers. We'll send you the PDF version of it. We have that all as well. Now, 
Twitter the conversation wants to buy t-shirts for itself and also for other people that are for, for the speakers that we have. So this is our design that you're looking at right here. So we're going to tell you more about it. This was just our initial design from yesterday. And then we're going to tell you more about it. But now the most important thing is airtime donations. Listen up. We run a platform where we buy airtime for people to get into the platform and uh, listen to the word. So if you want to contribute to it, and thank God some people are contributing, then you can contact me. I'm and that's my South African number, 073-974-8498. Ashley is next in, 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 in charge of that one day, uh, 076-890-5511. So please do contact Ashley or me, but more preferably me. Now I'm always the first port of contact there when it comes to this issue of airtime contribution. So uh, we're, really, we're running short of money, but there's a lot of people asking for, for, for airtime and data. So if you can help, please do. I know there are people that are still in South Africa, there are others uh, overseas. Please do um, and help us, we'd really, really appreciate. Thank you, as much said and done right there. Let me stop sharing. And then I'm gonna go and look for Uzolani quickly, and I'm gonna ask him to unmute himself, then to put on his video as well, because I want to pin him here and we are ready. Okay, Zolani, my man, talk to us. I need to see your video. You need to say something to me to confirm that you're good to go. Then we're about to start. Where are you? Can you, can you hear me? Okay, let me try that again. Um, I can see you from this perspective, um, but I cannot, um, I can hear you rather, but I cannot see you. Another again, um, Ashley, I need to see where you are so that I can I can I can I can try and unmute you and see if maybe there's a problem on our side. Actually, just lift up your hand wherever you are, or or Kosi, or Melissa, or Lisa, or whoever there is there, or Leander. Just lift up your hand so that I can be able to, to unmute you from here. Okay, thank you. All. See you. There you are. Boy. I'm unmuting you, okay? Um, sure, boy. Happy Sabbath, sure. everybody. Yes, yes. All right, boy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, boy. So let's okay, just check with the speaker. That, um, yeah, just, just check him again. Okay, cool. In the, meantime, take take up, let me call him. In the meantime, take over. Let me call him, okay? All right. Uh, okay, what do I say now? Just wait. We apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, we are looking forward to the afternoon lesson. Uh, I think that our speaker is just having a very, very slight technical problem, which, it's be, which should be sorted anytime from now. Uh, I see, Lubanda, your hand is up. You might want to wait until the program starts uh, for you to comment. The speaker is locked out, the room is full. That's what Michelle is saying there. Van Heeren says cold feet. It's not easy here by 2.30 conversation. So maybe the speaker is getting cold feet, but I doubt it very much. Here we go. The speaker is here now. All right. Good to go now. Zalan is good yeah. to go. <laughs> Welcome, man. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. I'm going to and then Zulani, take us through, man. Listen, we're praying for you. God bless you. Everybody else, man, God bless you. Zulani, it's up to you. I'm going to close the video. If you need anything, just holler. God bless you. Hallelujah. Sure, yeah. No, I'm sorry. It's an exciting time, man. Uh, difficult week. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, I hope that you are. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, Mtai has tried to to really introduce the, the topic today and nice build up. I love the concept. I love the work that you guys are doing to try and, uh, and really keep us engaged during this time. Uh, it's not an easy time. I think everybody's under, is under pressure, whether financially, uh, emotionally, mentally, whatever it is that you're going through, you're probably not in the best of spaces right now. And we, we continue to pray that we were able to overcome this difficult time. Um, so I've been asked to talk about something very sensitive in my life. But I really think it's, a, it's going to be a balanced approach to, to this topic. Um, I'm not a marriage counselor, first of all. I think that's the first disclaimer I'm going to make. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a professional when it comes to handling uh, certain issues about marriage. I'm just a guy with a particular story and uh, that's willing to share 
the learnings of, of my particular journey. I think a lot of a lot of the stuff that I learned was actually after my marriage when I had an opportunity to to almost look back retrospectively and and, and reflect on on where I particularly got it wrong, um, how I could have avoided getting it wrong, and um, what do I need to do going into the future to almost get it right. So we touch a lot on 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 a couple of topics, and I think some of them are not necessarily um, going to be in depth, but you'll find that uh, they are within particular topics. So they, they are, they are. Touch on these particular things, yeah, these particular topics. As I mentioned, I'm not a professional, didn't go to school for this. This is just me sharing my particular story and, and hoping that we can have an engagement. I'm going to try and take up about 20 minutes of our time. And then uh, we'll then hand over back to Mta to basically uh, take us through um, with, uh, with the questions and answers. I'm a very talkative person. I'm a conversationalist by nature. So, so I'm gonna try and really monitor myself and make sure that I, I don't talk too much. So love, marriage and divorce, uh, from my perspective, um, I think uh, the topics speak for themselves. I hope everybody can, can, can see them. Ta, if you can confirm if, if everybody can see the topics on your side, I'm not sure. Hello, Ta. Good. I can see that. Yeah, we're good. We're good to go. Okay, cool. So yeah, so I think, you know what? The sensitivity of the topic will allow us to, to determine how, how deep we go, right? And I, I did say, this is a very balanced sort of approach on my side. Um, and I, I was inundated with calls from family and friends this week asking me, are you sure after six years, do you wanna come out and actually talk about this thing? I talk about it quite a lot on Facebook and then Instagram, those, those who follow me. I try and balance it out with my McFry Sunday. So I'm a huge believer of love and, 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 and not just any love, the perfect love. It's just very unfortunate that uh, from a young age, I was, I was not necessarily exposed, but I had an opportunity to be married and, and, and what should have been an, an eternal commitment had its own challenges, had its own flaws. And I guess today I find myself as a 33 year old man who's divorced, got married at eight, Age 22, yes, I'm tired, did it at 22. What the hell was I thinking? I don't know, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about how we got there and how we actually now survived that period. And, and post that, we, we talk about how am I surviving now? So the topics speak for themselves. And um, as I said, I'm gonna try and balance them out. So let's go in. So, so, so it would be unfair for me not to, to balance out the, today's discussion by, by, by starting off with, with where does it all start? So where does it, where, where does the potential breaking apart of a relationship or a marriage or whatever you're engaged in actually start? And I fundamentally believe that what you are during your developmental stages is what you're gonna bring into any sort of relationship, whether business, whether a marriage, whether you're in the dating game, your fundamental belief system, how you were raised, how you were indoctrinated in the home will determine the type of human that you obviously are. In, in certain situations. So, so I, was, I, was, I, was, I was privileged enough um, that I was raised by both parents, very stable. I can never complain about the fact that I'm emotionally unstable. Um, I was raised by both parents. My, my, my parents were civil servants. My mom uh, today, she's still alive. Uh, she's a nurse at, uh, for, the, for, for, I think, Charlotte Matlaike uh, and Vitz. My dad, unfortunately, he passed away in 2013 which was a huge contributing factor to, to how I ended up being divorced because he was a key pillar in my life. And we'll talk about that as we unpack today's program. And, and, and so as I was saying, my parents were civil servants. I was raised in a very stable home. So emotionally I was well taken care of. Um, like any other stable home, I was disciplined um, by both parents to make sure that I grow up to be a man that I am today. And I can pass that over to my children. Um, I was given the right belief systems in the context of my home, taught conflict management. Um, I was exposed to, to financial management and financial in accordance and in the context of my parents and where they came from. And those that come from families of civil servants, you'll know that uh, you're not the wealthiest um, um, families in the world, but, but you just try and really survive um, the economics of our country. So, so I, I, I had the opportunity to be taken to good schools, uh, a good education and a proper social structuring. So when you meet me in person, you start to realize that 
I don't have necess- I'm not necessarily the most sociable person. I'm a social dwarf, but I'm also a person with uh, a lot of confidence when I need to have a lot of confidence. So my parents really embedded the right belief systems in me, gave me the level of confidence that I needed, disciplined me when I needed to, to, to be disciplined. And I really grew up in a very stable home. So I think that's very important as we delve into how did we get to a point where I'm at today? So your developmental stages are your most important that will determine how you interact throughout life. And I think that matters across the board. So we'll talk about that in terms of how it then, then uh, found itself into my marriage, my relationships. And, and today we don't only talk about my marriage, we talk about also how I interacted in other relationships post my marriage. I think that's also a fundamental key point that we need to talk about. So how did I survive uh, post marriage or post divorce situations? And we'll talk about that. Very interesting stuff today. Uh, I'm actually now starting to wonder why am I here, but we'll, we'll, we'll continue to try and then take the risks as we go along. So my parents, um, that will be sort of what I fundamentally believe my parents were. So my father was a leader, speaker, provider, stubborn, intelligent, educated, ambitious, risk taker, self-aware and strong character. Now you immerse that into my personal character and balance it out with my mother's character you find uh, uh, um, 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 the type of person that I've grown up to be, the environment that I grew up in. So I've, I've got a balance of both my father's characteristics and my mother's characteristics, and we, 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 which has got a huge bearing on how uh, I was in marriage. Um, and we'll talk about the type of husband <laughs> I was. Um, I can never claim that I was the most perfect husband. Uh, played my part, tried to be a provider, protector, and whatever that I, I tried to be. Um, and we'll talk about where did it all go wrong. My belief system, I was raised in the church with church fundamentals, Christian parents, Christian grandparents. I'm a third generation Adventist, so Adventism runs through my lineage. Um, and from a family perspective, my belief system, which is something that most marriages don't really, before you get married, people don't really talk about the family structure in terms of how do we welcome and keep contact and keep our families close so that both parties can enjoy continuous engagement with their family. So from a belief system perspective, when you looked at, 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 at my fundamental belief system as an individual, I'm a big family person, not only the, 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 the nuclear family in terms of my wife and my kids, but my parents, my brothers, whoever, I'm a person who grew up in an environment where uh, family was always taken care of, you, you, you give to family, you nurture family, and you welcome, welcome them into your space when, when they have a time of need. And my belief systems have always incorporated that. I'm a strong believer in helping people, making sure that if I see you struggling with something, I bring into my space, try and assist you as much as I can. And that almost caused a little bit of a, of a cultural conflict in my, in my relationship because my, my, my counterpart came from a smaller family and, um, and didn't really understand the dynamic of a bigger sort of family, especially in our intimate spaces. They don't almost add it to the conflict of where we are today. When you look at education, education was a big discussion in my, in my, in my home, uh, to the point where I felt that, you know what, I needed to carry on with my education, even post my, 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 my initial education. So, which then filtered into my, into, my, into my marriage, because at a point when I needed to be focusing on, on self-development, I was continuing with my studies, which had a huge bearing on, on uh, how much time I spent with my family, how much time I spent with my partner. So, so the times and the moments when I needed to be developing as a young man, I was now finding myself in a marriage. And because of my time focus on, on my education, that almost had a huge uh, sort of impact on, 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 on the time spent within the home. So, so when you look at all these creeping compromises and what, what, what decisions I was making from a very young age, you, you tend to think that, that my marriage decision was very premature. And I'll take you through how it happened, right? So, so from a belief system perspective, education was very big for me. Discipline was very big for me and work ethic culture was very big for me. So I was raised with these particular belief systems. And the biggest challenge was I could not necessarily um, um, sort of <laughs> force my, my partner to believe in the same things that I believe in. So you've got two people who are coming from two different backgrounds who are now coming together to try and build something, but the belief systems are not intertwined. And that's always gonna be a recipe for, for disaster because when I'm trying to, to embed the culture that I was taught, she's also trying to embed the culture that she was taught and not necessarily saying that any of our viewpoints were incorrect, 
But because we come from two different backgrounds, the two coming together was a bit difficult. So we'll talk about, about, about how the belief system element of any relationship can cause conflict because it doesn't necessarily mean that my belief systems are superior, but those are my belief systems. So if I've lived 22 or 23 years, it will be very difficult for me to let go of the things that I was raised to believe in and my fundamental belief systems. And how does, how does that filter and affect your marriage? It's the fact that at a very young age, you have not yet developed psychologically and, and learned how to compromise and, and, and make others happy. From a very young age, you not even a very young age, but when you enter into relationships prematurely, you, you don't realize that, first of all, you're not prepared for the level of commitment. And secondly, you don't realize that at the heart of every relationship and the core of a relationship is actually compromise. That filtered into my relationship from my perspective because I was a very stubborn husband. I was not, I was not the most open and the most um, easily convincible on certain elements I believed in, 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 what, in the things that I believed in. So the room for, for negotiation was very minimal, especially on my belief systems. And, and, and I actually look back now and I think about how I've actually had to let go of my stubbornness in order to incorporate other people's views. And that because of, it's something that's been immersed in me for so long, it's, it's almost been a personal struggle to, to, to kind of, um, of let go of old ways of thinking and bring in a new way of thinking. But that also brought in a lot of challenges in my marriage because of when the room and the platform for negotiation was, need, was needing to be created, each person had their particular views. And because of we were so young in, in marriage and so young in the relationship, uh, we felt that our, our, our viewpoints were the Bible, our viewpoints were the correct ones. And whenever we needed to come to the table and discuss, everybody was coming with their own perspective and their own viewpoints, which poses a challenge because of when we need to solve issues and, and actually have a level of, of conflict management, we had already made up our minds about how this thing should be handled. And that was a huge issue because of, of the fact that you can't move past situations if you already think that you've got the answers. What I've had to learn now over the years was to empty myself in every situation, to try and meet people halfway, to almost listen before I talk. And I actually posted this the other day on Facebook, I said, um, historically, when I would go on dates, um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would be the one that's always driving the conversation. And I've, I've realized now that I've become a more mature person. So hypothetically, if I had to go into a date right now, I would opt to listen before I actually bring across my opinion. So, so what am I basically saying? My marriage, um, as much as marriage and the institution of marriage was the right thing, unfortunately, because I was not prepared both mentally I can say physically I was prepared, I was prepared, but mentally and emotionally, I was not ready to actually encounter the challenges that came with marriage. It then made marriage a very difficult thing to continue in because of when I needed to listen, I was talking. And when I needed to hear, I was, I was, I was not willing to hear. And that almost filtered into quite a lot of the elements and the conflicts that we had in the marriage because of I was not meeting people halfway. My view was my view. And I had to now live with the fact that um, because of my stubborn nature, I now had to obviously bear the fruits of, of the stubborn nature. So we talk a lot about, about that. But when we talk about my interpretation of love, so, so those that have got opportunity to follow me on Facebook or those that I follow on Facebook will realize that I'm a huge believer in love. I mean, I, I do make Friday Sundays. I'm a huge advocate of love and the perfect love. I still believe that my opportunity to get married again and, and sail off into the sunset still exists irrespective of of my previous uh, challenges in, in marriage and, and relationship. Where I am right now is that I am ready to take that leap of faith again because I think I know more. But at the beginning, my love language and my interpretation of love was taught to me by my parents. As much as uh, a traditional parents from, from, from back in the day, which my parents were, they, I don't remember my parents ever coming home to each other and them giving each other a, 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 a greeting in the form of a kiss or whatever. Uh, but I always knew that my father loved my mother because of the undertones, the, the, the expression of love in him providing and, and protecting my mother during times when I was out of, out of line, when I would actually try and stand up to my mother and, and, and talk back. My father would always step into the gap and almost close the gap. And, and I saw the love undertones, the consistency of his actions of, of always being there and making sure that he's got his wife by, by his side um, and, and their permanent partnership infused by loyalty. Um, like any other child, 
I was never exposed to, to, the, to the difficult side of, of their marriage. I only saw the beauty. So my interpretation of love was always based on how I was raised and what I experienced through my, through my, through my parents. And that, that, that's what I always wanted. When I got married, the idea of getting married was based on, on, on the beauty and, and, the, and the beautiful picture that my parents and many other couples that I saw in my space actually now uh, exposing their, their, their level of love. And I thought, you know what? That's what I wanted from my home. That's that, that undertone love, that, that, that ability to, to handle the, the, the intensities of responsibilities without looking like it's difficult. I always wanted to, to have a beautiful home without understanding that foundationally, the foundations is what's, is what's important. And I think one thing that I always look back on and, 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 and the mistake that I made in marriage was, was I didn't invest time foundationally trying to get to know my counterpart. And the most difficult part about that was, was that I knew that she's a great person, she's a great human, and I loved her to death. The, the only thing is that because of the different belief systems, we could not find a way to handle certain levels of conflict, how we interpreted uh, um, certain belief systems or certain principles. And we found ourselves always circling around same or similar issues and not being able to move past them and, and me having a particular expectation, which added actually now to the, to the, to the, to the actual breaking of the marriage. And, and, and I always wanted the love and the marriage that my parents had without realizing that this was a new chapter. And, and that's one thing when you get married young, when you get married young, you have um, a little or no knowledge of what it takes to actually uh, um, make mature decisions or even have a sustainable home and sustainable relationship because you haven't had enough time to be taught of the fundamentals. The responsibilities of a man within the marriage are big, you know, and, and I think for me, when I was 22 and I got married, I was now thrown into the deep end where I had to now provide, I was studying, I was a father at that point, and I now had to play all of these roles. And at some point it became emotionally overwhelming because also my insecurity started creeping in the sense of, am I doing the right things? Am I making the right decisions? And when you're 22, you almost look at other people looking at you to say, can he really lead a home? And, and, and my, my, my biggest insecurity was, how do I take this family forward, both financially, emotionally, spiritually, when I myself haven't had enough time foundationally to fix myself? And when the issues and the conflicts came up, I was not able to handle them in a matured manner and everything became escalated and we ended up now having to part ways. So, so I had a situation where I wanted this perfect love at the same time, not matured enough to handle the pressure that came with it. And it all resulted in us having to part ways. Did I want to part ways? I, I don't think anybody wants to end the relationship, especially when you love each other. When you parting ways, it's no longer about the love. It's about your interpretation of what's right and what's wrong. And I talk about the involvement of the church just now, and I, I want us to unpack that in terms of there were certain stakeholders or players or role players that I felt should have come to the salvation of our marriage that didn't. And, and, and when I look at it retrospectively now, and when I go back into time, a lot of the conflicts, we tried to handle them ourselves without looking for external validation or external input. But the problem with that was we would always go and ask about situations that we could have solved ourselves and the situations that needed external input we didn't go and there was just a lack of, of of understanding and maturity levels within within the relationship so how did we get there how did i get to a point where i now at age 22 ask a woman uh to actually marry me so so when i asked my 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 ex to marry me i had romanticized the entire picture now, the difficult part about romanticizing is that you, 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 you overlook fundamental principles that should lead you to making the right decisions. You're clouded by emotion more than reason. And there's a certain level of selfishness more than actual coming together of two people. She was, she, she was beautiful. I was a level of beautiful woman. And I wanted her all to myself. And I was like, you know what? no sisi and I can't allow anybody else to have her. And I started now picturing the next 20 years with each other. And the immediate response was, let's get married. Um, so I entered this relationship selfishly, thinking about myself and not realizing that I'm actually asking someone's child to come into my world and accept who I am so we can build a life together. Prematurely so, we entered the marriage. 
or we get engaged all because of selfishly so i wanted her to myself i was not willing to share this person with anybody else and when you make decisions based on feelings um, and how you feel it's unsustainable the unsustainability is that feelings disappear and now you have to pull into a space where you have to start making functional decisions. My, my, and, and what actually pushed up our marriage was the fact that my, my wife got pregnant and we now had to push up the wedding date to try and, 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 and almost take responsibility for the situation. So, so we got married because we got engaged, but we pushed up the date because of she got pregnant. And that's something that's very sensitive to me because people always ask me, so if you pushed up because she was pregnant, you didn't love her? And I said, I loved her. And, and that's, why, that's why I felt at that point that the right thing to do and to respond through her getting pregnant was me doing the right thing. And, and, and I didn't realize at that point that there was a rocky foundation because it meant that potentially we were building something on the wrong principles. And I'm not saying that anybody who gets pregnant or does not deserve to be committed or be given that opportunity to spend the rest of their life with their partner. But it goes beyond that. When you commit yourself to someone, it should be on the basis that whatever challenges you guys face together, you're able to work through them. When I responded to the pregnancy, it was not a fundamental that should have driven me to marriage. It's something that I fundamentally look back and said, okay, fine. Had I prepared for the marriage, I would not be where I am today. And, 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 which, and this topic is it's crazy because it's got so many filters to it. It's got so many elements to it that we can't just finish it all in one day, but we had not done our foundational work. We didn't spend enough time getting to know each other in a relationship. We dated for, I think, about six, seven months, and then we were married, and, and, and the groundwork was not done. And, and I, I wrote about this on Facebook the other time, and I said, you know, the, the biggest distortion in our church or the biggest issues in our church is that we think compatibility is when people look good together. And, and compatibility, the test of compatibility is not how good you guys look together. It's the stuff that people can't see, the, the home front, the stuff that the world does not get to experience. Compatibility says the belief systems coming together, will they be able to be sustainable into the future? We had not done the groundwork. We found ourselves with a, 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 a situation where we, we knew we loved each other, we were engaged and she fell pregnant and we had to get married but the groundwork was not done. And that almost caused a lot of rockiness because in preparation for future conflicts or future differences, we didn't have enough time to prepare outside of the marriage. We were forced to solve these things at a high pace, high intensity, and, and, and leading us to making all the wrong decisions. So, so I think that's almost when you romanticize the decision of love, it's, it's, it's something that I'm not saying that we should not want to fall in love with our emotions. However, an eternal decision as big as, 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 as marriage cannot only depend on our feelings. It must be more than that. It must be compatibility. And we speak about compatibility just now in the sense that I even, I've gone as far now post my divorce to say, okay, fine. If I want to do this again, if I'm going to enter this, uh, this, this landscape of marriage again, what are the fundamentals to me that matter? And the fundamentals touch both spiritual, emotional, mental, physical, um, it touches on, 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 on self-development. So, so, so I'm doing a lot of work right now where I'm developing myself both in business and I'm looking at actually furthering my education. And there's a lot of work that I'm doing right now to almost prepare my mind and my heart to enter marriage. And, and I think had I had that opportunity at age 21, 22 to, to be guided through the situations and the, the, the self-development element, I would have been able to survive another five to six years with the same woman um, 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 and potentially prepare us uh, both at a, at a, at a, from, from a couple perspective and individually for the life that we really wanted. So we dreamt big. We, 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 my, my, my marriage was not all bad. It wasn't all doom and gloom, but it had its challenges and it had the, the, the challenges that we had were bigger than, 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 than the situations that, that we were happy in. So I felt that if I couldn't handle certain situations, my belief systems were not being met or were not being heard, the best way would not be for us to actually continue in the marriage. And we talk about that a bit later on. So, so every relationship is an investment of your time and your energy. You have to have the standards. What do you want from a person? So these are the fundamental questions that people never ask. What are you bringing to the table? 
And I look about, I look at it, I look at it right now, and I think about it right now. The one fundamental question that I always think about right now is that should I enter marriage again? And the question is, what are you bringing to the table? And this goes beyond financial. It goes to a point where what's your interpretation of family? What's your interpretation of of in-laws? How how do you relate to my social circle? What's your interpretation and what's your view on self-development? So so when you set up those standards and you know yourself, it's easy for you to then start asking the questions of what are you bringing to the table? I never had that opportunity. I never asked the questions. I never got time to actually understand myself and what I want. I fell in love with a girl and all I wanted was I wanted her in my space permanently. As to what that meant, I didn't really understand. And as I grew as a man, between those years that I was getting, I was, I was married, I started realizing that the man that I was at 22 when I got married, at 25, I was no longer that person. The stuff that I could tolerate at 22, at 25 now, I'd had three years of reasoning. I said, I can't tolerate certain things anymore. And, and that almost added to us parting ways because when certain things repeated themselves at 22, I could forgive them. At 26 or 25, I found myself not having the level of tolerance that I would have had at 22. So as I evolved as a human being, I started having different expectations and the failure to communicate those expectations then led to us then having a, a conflict and us breaking apart. And I think when we set the standards, marriage is not necessarily for old and mature people, but it's for people that have really found stability emotionally, mentally, and, and have really set a path out for themselves and these milestones that they've, they've, that they've met. And, and when they enter into, into a relationship with someone, you, you might not have met all your, your self expectations, but you at least 80 to say, I mean, 70 to 80% or 90% there, it's easy for you to then build a life with someone. And I think a lot of people struggle with identity crisis in marriage because of you entered it prematurely without you having seen the best version of yourself. And you end up now wanting to do certain things inside the marriage, as opposed to you should be settling, you're now trying to explore yourself. I found myself having that feeling and having that desire to say, okay, fine, there's so much more I can do with my life in terms of self-development, but because of certain challenges that I'm having in my marriage, I can't. So now I have to then, in the midst of all the conflicts, when I made the decision to walk out of the marriage and almost take time off, it was not because of she was not the right person. It was also a, a factor of the conflict, the stuff, the belief systems that we differed on had, had gone far beyond my ability to want to resolve them. Because I also felt that I now want different things for my life. I can't be dealing with the same things from the same people. So I felt that, you know what, to, to, to almost want myself at the best version of myself, I have to exit the space which restricts me from actually getting to the places where I want to be. There's a lot of things that happened emotionally in my world. I got married young, I got divorced very young. So even at the point of, of separation, Potentially, I might not have made the best decisions, but I, I know one thing is that I, I had realized that I got into a point where I was evolving as a human being and my level of tolerance for certain things had, had, had actually reached its threshold. And I wanted, I wanted peace of mind. I wanted a, 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 an environment where I could rebuild myself and, and almost get emotional stability. There's a lot that happened in my world and I, I, I then had to rebuild my level of standards. And I now had to look at the things that I wanted to bring to myself and to the person that I want to love into the future. Standards start with you. Who you are as you enter the relationship, right, will also reflect in the relationship. Compatibility is the truest test of your love story. If you guys are not compatible, even on the minutest of things, and I'm not talking about <laughs> things that you can easily overcome, but on the belief, I speak a lot about the belief system. If you guys are not compatible on belief system, the relationship is not going to work because of if two belief systems come together and, and one is asked to compromise, a couple of years later, I've compromised everything that I believed in for you. And when I start settling in the marriage or in the relationship, I start realizing, but no, I don't want to let go of certain things. Actually, this is who I am. So compatibility goes deeper than just saying she's Adventist or he's Adventist. Compatibility says on the stuff that, that people can't see, on the stuff that that made me who I am. What am I willing to accept and what am I not willing to expect, accept? The feeling of emotion, right, is always gonna be there, but you have to make the practical and functional decisions to carry on in a relationship or even start a relationship. Don't enter your relationship with your heart. Test the strength of the foundation. I think if I had a fundamental list of things, 
um, at age 22, I, I, I would have realized that I myself am not, I'm not ready for marriage. And, and it's, it's very easy for me to, to sit here and try and put the blame in one court. I also understand fundamentally that I added to the frustration of marriage. Whether I was right or wrong at, at point of, of the exit, I think that there was a lot of buildup of certain things which, which hampered me from, from actually being the best husband or the best father. There's a lot of things that I could have done better. But I also think that had I invested a lot more time trying to investigate or, or trying to find out what type of person I wanted to be or what type of person I wanted in my life, a lot of stuff would not have actually transpired, right? And I think one of the other things, and, and this is where now it gets very sensitive with the church discussion now, is that the church watched us enter into engagement, the church watched us getting into, into a relationship, and we didn't spend a lot of time asking from existing couples, couples that have done this thing for years, asking them for guidance because we didn't have time. We didn't have, we didn't create the platform for, for asking of questions. We went into the marriage, guns blazing, and we just wanted to make this thing work. We wanted to, to live an eternal life with each other. And we didn't ask about how to handle the pressures of marriage. And I, 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 I really encourage people that are going into marriage to ask the questions, to get in, in, in intimate with the idea of what does marriage really look like and not get the ideas that we are shown, but get the ideas from people that are willing to be very practical in how marriages should actually run functioning. I speak about self-development before commitment. So relationships require a certain level of time investment. So, so does your development. So at what point did you get married? Uh, when you've done your MBA, when you've got your undergrad, when you're the CEO of a business, or when you've gotten to a certain level of management, your ambitions will potentially affect the, 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 the intimate parts of your relationship. If you're a very ambitious person, you're going to struggle to actually balance your ambitions with your marriage because of if your partner's not on the same wavelength as you, they're going to feel as if you're neglecting them for your dream. So at what point do you commit, right, to self-development? And what point do you then commit to another person? There needs to be a balance where you say, okay, fine, I've achieved as much as I could. I'm ready to now share this life that I've built individually with another person that has potentially also equally achieved their own dreams. Because one thing I'm finding is that we also had dreams at different particular points in time. I wanted to push my education at some particular point in time. Uh, and she was not studying at that point. And then it switched over where I was now slowing down on my education and she wanted to push her. And that, that, that time allocation where we started now wanting our own ambitions, our own things, actually strained the relationship. So did we travel the world? At that point, I had not traveled the world. So I, 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 I now, after my divorce, I, I, I now wanted to travel more and start actually now exploring what the world has for me the financial gains and stability, the mental and emotional stability. I actually remember after I, I got separated, not yet divorced, I started going for counseling to understand what was wrong with me. Why, what insecurities did I have which could have potentially led to the breakdown of the relationship. And I spent a lot of time on myself trying to understand and unpack me because why was I a person that if I felt hurt, I was finding it very difficult to, to, to forgive and, and why am I struggling with certain concepts and certain ideas? Why can't I compromise? So there's quite a lot of things that when I got into the separation and the divorce, I was forced now to work on myself because I needed to prepare myself for the next person. If I'm gonna build a life again, I can't take the same toxicity and my own insecurities and bring them into the next space. So, so over the years, in the past six years, I've done a lot of work on myself. I've, 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 I've built a business and it's, 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 it's running very well. And, and I've seen myself evolve, not only as, as, as a human being or as a Christian, but also as a leader. And, and I've seen that, that development of part of my life. So I've really gone through the challenges and the ups and downs of relationships uh, over the years, but I've really now gone into a point where I know what I want. And it was through hard work. It was through me now saying to myself, what's the honest truth about me? What did I do that added value to the detriment and, and to the destruction of my marriage? And when I've answered those questions honestly, I've now found myself to say, okay, fine, if I'm gonna do this thing again, right? As much as people are scared of marrying a divorced person because you come with all this experience, if I'm gonna do this all again, I need to get into the space being fair to the other person. And, and I struggle now because, because my biggest fear is that if I get into a marriage again, I'm gonna bring the, the demons of the past. So that's why I continue to work on myself. I continue to invest a lot of time in understanding how I think and, and how I feel about certain things. And I'm, I'm really, I've really become more vocal 
about my belief systems. I've really become more vocal about what I fundamentally believe in. So, so I've adopted new sort of ways of, 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 of being a social being. So there's quite a lot of things that I do uh, to actually make myself a sober person. And, and I think that's gonna matter going into the future. Why did I really get divorced? I got divorced, as I mentioned earlier, because we disagreed on key principles. We clashed on belief systems. And one thing that I always um, talk about, I say we were young. And with us being young, the complexities of, 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 of marriage and the depth of it, we didn't understand how to solve some of the issues. And I think, you know, marriage is beautiful when you do it young, and, and, but when you've done the work pre-marital. So, so we never had the time to actually do pre-marital work because of situations just happened. But I think the age factor played a huge role. It played a huge role in how we wanted to solve conflicts, how we strategized about certain things. Very ambitious, very energetic, and we wanted to work through our own desires and our own dreams at an individual level. We struggled with conflict management independently, right? So as a couple, we, we struggled to solve our own issues. So when we went external to ask for guidance, we also struggled there. So, so, so for us, we found ourselves in a continuous conflict because we couldn't solve key components of our marriage. And, and, and to this day, I've had to accept the fact that if I'm going to do this thing again, if I'm gonna enter marriage again, I must be willing to listen to the other side of the story. I must be willing to, to forgive. I must be willing to, to, to almost put myself in another person's shoes. For as long as I'm not, I'm not ready to compromise on my belief system and the things that I fundamentally believe uh, are, are my belief system or, or the things that I fundamentally believe are our way of life, for as long as I think like that, I'm not ready to take the step of marriage again. So, so we struggled. The reason why we got divorced, one of the core components, we disagreed on a lot, on, on, on a lot of key principles, not everything, key principles, right? So, so, so relationships are tested uh, on the depth and not necessarily on the surface. And I mentioned this earlier on, I said compatibility is not a test of how good you look together. Compatibility is a test of, of, of the stuff that people can't see. So we may look together, but do we click on the things that matter? So that's really a compatibility test. Where was the church when it all came crumbling down? <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna take a breath here. Um, and, and so it's really one of those situations where how much does the church get involved um, in your personal space? And I think my friends are Adventists, my family's Adventists, we eat Adventist, I mean, we, 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 we live Adventist principles and, and we find the church having a huge influence on us on our day-to-day -day, uh, operational function. And when, when, when I feel as if, when the church stepped in to try and save the marriage, it was already too late. And what is the expectation of the church? The church needs to get involved before we even decide to take it to the next step in terms of the relationship or the marriage. When the church got involved at the end, my, my mind was already made up. I had already gotten to a point where I knew that we'd gotten to a point of no return. And sending the deacons and sending the elders was not gonna help. I think I wanted more than that. I think there was, there was something bigger that I, that I would have wanted uh, to, to, from the church and it wasn't at that point. And when I look back retrospectively, when I look back into time, I, I feel that even before I got married, the church should have stepped in in some way or form from a guidance perspective, from a preparation perspective. Um, and there were certain intervals in my marriage that I felt that um, the church should have been involved either through visitations and checking up on the family or checking up on me and my wife where we were emotionally and just creating the platform. And, and this is, this is a difficult concept because a lot of people want to shut the church out, especially on the domestic issues. And, and it's almost an unfair expectation if, 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 if I'm going to make that expectation of the church getting involved towards the end, as opposed to during the, the relationship. And I know it's a very difficult notion and, and I take full accountability, but I also feel that the church getting involved at the end did not help the situation. Um, I don't, I, don't, I don't remember my pastor getting involved. I, at that point, I don't remember my pastor who he was or where he was from. And that's one of the key things that I, that I always talk about to my friends. I said, how involved does the church get into your marriage? And how involved do they get 
fundamentally in trying to solve the domestic issues. And it's a difficult topic, but I think we can unpack it as we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so there, the church must, must get involved at different intervals, as I mentioned. Uh, health checks through pastors' visitations, a proactive approach, and we can talk about that. I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert, as I mentioned. I think we can have the open discussion about that. In-laws, the silent killer. Yeah. So, 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 so both sides. Um, I think both families have to take accountability, um, not only on my part, but on any marriage that falls apart. I think, I think the depth and the involvement of the in-laws when things have now gotten to a point where the, the, the main culprits are no longer willing to sit down and talk. I think the, the failure of the families to meet each other halfway just leads the entire discussion down the drain. And, and I always think back and I always talk to my best friends about this is that the level of involvement of your in-laws and, and, and your parents will dictate where the marriage ends up. Because if I'm holding my parents in high regard and, and I have a conflict in my marriage, I'm going to go to them asking them for guidance, but because I'm their child, their default position is to protect me. And that almost adds to the animosity between mother, daughter, mother and, and, and daughter-in-law sort of uh, uh, conflicts or, or, or son and father-in-law conflicts, because if I'm coming and I'm bringing issues and I, I'm complaining about my wife that she's not doing X, Y, and Z, I don't think my, my parents would be the best people to actually go and engage in a particular matter because they would have had an expectation that their child or their, their daughter is being treated in a particular way. We found ourselves in a situation where when I did involve uh, my parents and the in-laws, it, it, it became a situation where now it was run for cover, each to his own, and protect your own territory, protect my territory. And, and that almost added to the demise of the marriage because it meant now we were now protecting our own interests from a family structure perspective. And I would have done things differently had I had the opportunity to actually, how far do I allow my, my family and my in-laws to get involved in my relationship? And a lot of 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 people complain about the involvement of the in-laws about how involved do they get in the marriages. And for me, it's even the the discussion around um, when I'm not there and what guidance does my partner get from her parents about how to run the marriage. And and that level of involvement then dictates what then happens in the home. And and I think when I look at it now, um, it's always better to start off and 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 have people that mentor you that are outside the emotional sort of frontier. Families will always, whether consciously or subconsciously, subliminally want to protect their own cup. And, and when I look at it now, I said, you know what? Had I gotten other mentors or other couples that were gonna be completely neutral, we would have been both called out on, on some of the things that we brought to the marriage. Um, when we got the families involved, it was the situation just could escalate. And I think, I'm not saying that in-laws and, 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 and parents should not get involved. I'm saying you, you need to be very careful because of the default position of each family to then protect their own child. Um, and I think if the, if the in-laws are gonna get involved, it should be at a point where they want to fix the shortfalls in the marriage. And, and I think failing which both sides must take accountability for the demise of, of the marriage. And I think it's, it's, it's a phenomenon in African culture for, for, for parents and in-laws to always try and guide their children, especially when you look at how old we were when we got married, we were very young. So it was, it was, it was an easy playing field for external parties to come and try and guide us because they felt that, what did we know? And we didn't realize, I mean, we were, we were very in love. We didn't realize that every sort of entertain, interaction, sorry, every sort of interaction led to our perception of how the home should run. So, so when it comes into the in-law front, I think for me, it's very critical to say, how involved do your parents or your in-laws get involved in the operation of your marriage? And I think we get, we'll talk about this. Co-parenting after divorce. So this is fast forwarding now. Um, I'm going to try and wrap this thing up very quickly so we can get to the discussions. Co-parenting after divorce. We are now divorced. And how do we now raise this beautiful being um, um, who is our child we share? So one of the realities I needed to make peace with was <laughs> irrespective of, of, of what happens, this person is in my life forever. Uh, because we share this, this, beautiful, this beautiful child. And, and you can never be friends with your ex. It, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. But I think we need to be matured enough to understand that even though we're not friends, we need to co-parent this child, not based on our own desires, but on the fact that we want our child to see the best version of themselves. You have to put the children first. 
You have to work through the issues day by day. You have to learn how to set your feelings aside and be a functional parent. So we've had to learn these things over the years. When it first started, it was, it was, it was difficult because each person was trying to prove their own position. Um, and, and all of these issues over the years needed to be worked on. We needed to make sure that we start putting the child's interest at, at, at heart. And we had to be realistic about our position towards each other. And we have to be amicable. We have to, we, we have to not necessarily get along, but we need to realize that, that we're raising a human being and our feelings just don't matter. What is in the best interest of, 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 of the child? And I think a lot of couples, a lot of couples struggle here because, or a lot of ex-couples struggle here because that, that, that underlying feeling of, of, of he did me wrong or she did me wrong always supersedes the emotion of wanting to do right by the child. And I think it's going to be a continuous battle over time. It's not something that you can get over or overnight, but through work and through time investment, I think any couple that has, has gone through divorce can raise a child in an amicable situation. So I'm not going to go into depth in terms of this situation here. We are co-parenting the child. It's, it's going as well as it should. It's got its days where it's challenging, but I think, you know, the child is growing, beautiful baby. Um, she turns 11 this year, so she's, she's just an independent human being by herself. And yeah, I, I really pray for my daughter every day that, she's, that she does well. So dating after divorce, sensitive discussion for me. Um, I remember my first date um, after divorce. Um, I, I remember I had, I, I had taken time, years uh, in marriage, and I didn't even know how to interact in, in a dating setup. And, and, but now I had to, obviously post working on myself, now I had to start uh, basically being an eligible bachelor. And that's, that's a difficult discussion because now you're almost closing a very sensitive chapter of your life. You have to make peace that there's no going back and you have to move on with life. And it's not easy. So I stayed out of the dating game for about three years um, to, to focus on, on, on building my business, focus on myself. They did a couple of times, but it was a bit premature, didn't work out and, and went for counseling, as I mentioned earlier, focused on, on, on family, focused on building the business. And, and really today, I think I'm good. I think, I think uh, you can tell by McFrey Sundays that I'm making progress. And uh, I think, yeah, the, the future is bright for me in that space. Uh, where am I at now? I'm at peace with the stigma. Being young and divorced is not the greatest of things on earth. I think it comes with its own stigma. People do get a bit nervous to, to actually say, I always get asked the question, when's hey, you know, what did you do to add to the, to the breaking up of the, of the marriage? And I can't really go into, it, into the depth. I had to take my negative energy and, and, and divert it back into my business. And that has worked well. That has worked well. Uh, I'm mentally healthy. I'm mentally healthy. Sorry. I've dealt with, uh, with my insecurities and my demons. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's a great phenomenon what prayer and what, what, what a life in God can do to almost not necessarily help you to forget the pain, but help you accept it and help you to rebuild yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a point where now I'm good. I'm, I'm really good in terms of my, my emotional stability, my, my, my social circle. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where, with, with, with where I am right now. And I'm ready again. I think, I'm, I think after six years, I think I got divorced in 2015. I think after six years, I'm now officially ready to, to potentially start exploring the idea again. And now I know better, you know, and uh, I think uh, myself and Pastor Smoo, uh, Fire, we're writing a book. Uh, I think I'm just putting the advert out there. The book should come out next year in March or April. We started, we started the book this year. Conceptually, we're starting to write it now and hopefully it's, it's done. So uh, it, it talks about relationships, the Game of Thrones. Um, how, how to maneuver in relationships and get to a point where you can still be a sustainable human being, even though you've been through pain and, 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 and finding a new way to interpret your life again. Uh, my spiritual life, where do I think it is? I think uh, when, when you've been through what I've been through as an individual um, at a very young age and, and when, you, when, you, when you almost ask yourself a lot of questions, my spiritual life was critical but stable, but I think I'm, I'm starting to make headway in terms of how I view um, the church. And, and it, this, this was not a spiritual discussion per se. It was more of, I expected more from the church and the church didn't meet me halfway. But as I, as I, as I go on with time, I start to realize that in the bigger and the overarching theme of my life, I must take charge. 
um, I must make sure that I write this narrative for myself and I need to recreate the story for myself. So, so I think we, we've touched on, on almost everything in Ta. I'm gonna give back to you. I think we can open up for discussions. I'm welcome to any question. Um, I'm not one to shy away from questions. I think we'll probably get more from the discussions than we got from the, from the presentation. Mita? All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Um, maybe you can just stop sharing the screen so that I can have it on the full screen, yeah? Um, uh, we, we're very grateful, very thankful. We appreciate your maturity in all of this um, and the fact that God took you through this. Uh, we're going to have time now to start talking within ourselves. So what's happening now is you lift up your hand through the platform. I should be able to recognize you from where I am. And then once um, um, you lift up your hand, I will unmute you. You say what you need to say. You are allowed to also write stuff on the chat room. Ashley is in charge of the comments happening on the chat room and also on Facebook. Facebook happens to be more interactive right now uh, than what we have now. And there are more people on Facebook and they are here on the Zoom platform. So thank you so much, Zolani. Thank you so much for taking us through that one. Okay, a couple of hands coming up. I'm going to give the first round of hands. And here we go. That is in Ken Velase. You're going to take us through uh, on our first comment right there. I'm asking John Mutu. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zolani. Thank you so much for allowing yourself to be vulnerable in front of us and, and bring your story to us. I just want to say a couple of things from your, your, your presentation. The first one, I think it's a mistake that we all young people make. Marriage counseling is not meant for people who are preparing to get married. Marriage counseling is meant for people who are dating so th that they can decide whether or not uh, they want to get married or where this relationship is going. So we make the mistake of going for marriage counseling when we now are planning to get married. And yet marriage counseling should be to help us to decide whether or not we're compatible to get married. So I think it's, it's a big lesson for all of us young people that when you're now dating, uh, start going for counseling. It will help you see the things that you cannot see because love does make us blind. And then the second thing I just want to say is about church involvement in, in, in marriages and relationships. Uh, the church does not get involved in a couple's marriage or relationship unless they are invited. In the end, when things are now breaking up, we do get involved because then now we're coming with the legal guns, we're coming to shut you down and everything. But we do not normally get involved in your relationship unless you invite us. And I would encourage um, everyone who is in a marriage relationship, have, have mentors, you know, have, have, have all the couples, grown people who you can talk to um, when you are in trouble, because most of the time, church, uh, if you don't have a friend who is a grown up, people won't look at you. I mean, if you are new, you go there, you sit down in church, should experiment you go to a church where people don't know you no one will talk to you until church is over so i i would i would suggest that uh, if you are a couple have an older couple who's friends people you can talk to people who you can take things with there's this older man i i asked the question once i said why didn't you tell us that marriage was so difficult before we got married and he said to me if we tell young people that they will never get married so marriage is difficult, but we have to work on it every day. So um, Zolani, thank you for your, for, your, for, for, for your chat and for your experience. Uh, I've learned a lot today. God bless you, man. All right, thank you so much for that one. Thank you. I think that's one of our pastors day. And I think we're getting quite a lot of things. There's a lot of um, comments happening on the Facebook page and X is going to pile them up now. Let me give you the following hands in the following order. And please do remember that this is a very sensitive issue, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't express ourselves. We have one person here, Uzolani, has come out and like Umfundi to say, it's become very vulnerable. And how many of us can really talk about this um, and also blame probably partly themselves 
what happened and all the growth that they've learned in this particular moment. So that's a very brave thing for anyone to, to say. And like we'd say, the next coming topics that we're having, they're all to do with issues that affect marriage. And we're not bashing partners. And Zorani has come out quite well not to bash the partner, not even to mention her name. God bless you for that. Lubanda, you're next. Sakodi, you're next. And then Chichi from Malawi, I can see you in the garden. So let me give it in the following order. Lubanda, Sakodi, uh, Chichi, Chichi, that's Chichi from Malawi. And then that is uh, in the garden's church. In the following order, let's go. Um, afternoon, everyone. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm just sure what happened to you. mentioned earlier yeah. on. Um, yeah. yeah, sure, boy. Um, the, the perfect family setup has its own challenges. And they are so, they impact in a very big way, such that when I am raised in a very perfect family setup, when I meet someone who comes from a not so perfect family, as we put it, um, it's becomes, it becomes difficult for me to accept or to compromise uh, towards their certain belief system to a point that you think when uh, who come from a perfect family setup, you are better off than them in even in the in marriage. So you are the standard of the marriage. Whatever happens, they have to come up and meet the standard. So you can't compromise towards that. So you realize that there are certain things growing up as boys that taught us a lot of things. Those that had at Kekri, you realize that you'll be sent or pushed to do certain things that when you grow up, you realize they were teaching you a lot of skills. If you play Dipola Lema paper, at one point, because the owner doesn't know how to play football properly, but he is the owner of the plastic ball. He will be picked in the team and you who is a good player will be left outside. And that also taught you funny but critical lessons that as you grow up, when you employ those lessons, they help you to treat Abanyabantu in a different way or to accept certain situations. So I'm, I'm still pressing on the point, Yoguti. Sometimes the perfect family set up or perfect raising of our kids will may, 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 not will, may actually impact negatively on their marriages because it becomes difficult for them to bend towards certain directions when it need be. So that's point number one. Um, I think let me talk about point number one, Manje boy, and then I will raise the other one as, as the discussion progresses. All right, thank you so much, Ko, for that one. Thank you. So the upbringing of a person has a lot of influence into how the marriage situation would go. I think that's a very critical point to keep hammering into ourselves. I think that the outlook and, and the deliverables of this lesson are based more on a personal reflection. When I look into myself, and we're talking about people that are not married in this platform, people that are young and wanting to get married, people that are in a situation where they are married, but things are not looking well, and it, it's not going right. This could be where you can get help as well. People that are divorced are still here in this platform and all that. So we're really grateful for all those many number of people that are here. So let's keep helping each other. So we're saying to ourselves again, your upbringing has an influence and an impact into the fact that it can affect the marriage for the better or sometimes uh, for the worst. Sagodi. Sagodi, I'm unmuted. You said, um, I think you should be able to hear me. You are unmuted. Right. Okay. Sure, I can hear you. Okay, just okay. as a disclaimer, um, just as a disclaimer, guys, because uh, it's an international community, so let's try to, you know, I know my friends are young. All right, all right. Sure, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, Peter. This one is for you. Uh, 
Yes, thank you very much uh, for, for, for bringing such uh, a program that uh, benefits us see while we are in the comfort of uh, our homes. That is very, very brilliant, uh, guys. Keep it up. Right. I want to maybe first uh, talk to Uzolani because uh, it's, it's, maybe it's my first time seeing someone really coming out and uh, be, being real on the issue of divorce. Uh, since we're living in a, in a real world, we need to, 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 to hear such people. I'm really honored and uh, may the Lord bless you, uh, my brother, for, for doing that because it is very rare. It's, it's, uh, there's no pretense in that and uh, we are learning a lot, right? My name is Godswill, not married, in case people are wondering, Sakoti. Right, the first question uh, is, uh, I heard you didn't even try to blame your partner. Uh, that is very wonderful. You kept the blame to yourself. You were not ready, everything. But now my question was, is there a possibility that uh, the other partner contributed to the to the divorce or to the to the the crack uh, in your marriage then maybe the second one is uh, uh, as an Adventist uh, do you think that uh, there are certain beliefs or, or maybe assumptions I don't know how I can put it that are in our church that can, injure a uh, marriage in future because some of those teachings are, are not somewhat real they, like we, we want to play the perfect uh, marriage uh, type of people and forget the reality of things so i'm asking is there anything that you've picked from the church that maybe contributes to a lot of uh, divorces in our church uh, right, I think maybe for, for the sake of others, I would uh, end it there. Thank you very much, my brother. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sir Gordy, for that one. So Zolani is noting the questions there. Let me give to Chichi from Malawi, then the Guardian's Church, then I'll give over to Zolani to come through. Ashley, after Zolani comes through, you're coming next with the comments that are coming through, any questions that we could be having on Facebook or even on the Zoom platform here. Immediately after Ashley, during the pandemic, I think that's the name of the person here, during the pandemic here, yeah? We've got a couple of interesting names. There's Yellow Bond, the divorced, and there's Mtola the Panama. We're quite interesting. Okay, Chichi from Malawi. Take it up. What's happening, Chichi? Um, hi guys. Uh Solani, thank you. Can you hear me in time? Uh, okay. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. I have a question and um I'm, I'm sorry if I'm sort of putting Zolani on the spot, but uh, I would like to know, there are several verses in the Bible that talk about uh, uh, marriage after divorce being uh, being uh, a sin. So I wanted to find out uh, the same question Michelle asked, that is there uh, a possibility of reconciliation in, in that? And if anyone can answer me uh, that question, looking at the several Bible verses that say that if you divorce and if it was not sexual sin, then you are committing adultery if you get married again. Again, I apologize. Uh, thank you, okay. thank you for that one. Uh, one of my duties as a host is to protect the speakers. So I'm covered. I might not have the muscles, but I've got the the the, the you know, <laughs> I've got <laughs> not the muscle, but I've got the. Um, the mouse here, I can just, you know, sit and unmute and mute people at will. So, good question coming from Malawi from Chichi right there. The Guardians Church, you had your hand up. So, let me keep noting the questions, and I can't really see you anymore. So, let me just give to Jolo the pandemic. Say your point, because Guardians has just put down their hand, and immediately after, okay, Guardians is now up. Here we go, Guardians, and then Ashley, then Jolo will come through after that. The Guardians. Hi guys, and uh, thank you very much, Solani, for for such a discussion. I like it because it was so blunt and uh, straight to the point. 
uh, speaking of um, mistakes that most of us don't want to admit after such kind of a, a situation. Um, I just noted a few things that um, he spoke about that were relating to the family and also the up upbringing of, um, of individuals and uh, which uh, forced me to, to actually address us as youth in the sense that um, we are so proud of ourselves um, saying we are the fourth generation and we do not want to take counsel from, um, from, from our, our elderly. Why am I saying so? Um, I, I noted that um, so many times when there's problems, we want them to run to say the church or families when we didn't start with them in the first place. Um, this being said, um, I remember a time when um, when I actually wanted to get it, uh, to, to, to marry and things didn't work out. Um, I tried and practiced the, the, the training that we that we brought forward uh, that you, you have to actually involve the, the church, which I concur with Pastor Velase what he said earlier, saying that um, as you are dating, you need to you need to start the marriage counseling and all that so that at least you see whether this is um, is what is supposed to be done or it has to be stopped. So um, after all that has been um, taken through, you've gone through the counseling, you'll be able to make a decision whether to go to go ahead or not. But then Tina is um, our, uh, as youth of today, we, we think we know it all and our, our elders don't know nothing about marriage. Why am I saying so is that um, when we have a problem, we actually forget the training that we're taught to say when you marry, when you're marrying a certain lady from another family, you're actually marrying into that family. And if there is a problem in the home, you don't necessarily go back to your people, like uh, Zolani said, because of, um, of, 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 of certain things that uh, people will try to defend on you. Boy, go away, please. So when you marry a lady, you are actually marrying into another family. If the issue there a, a problem arise, you don't need to go to your to your own family, but you need to go to the other side of the family so that they can help. Because if you go to your own father or your own mother, they will definitely, by default, they are, they are your parents, they will definitely take your side and they will overlook everything else because of the relationship that you have. So going to your own family is, for me, I would say is a no-no because of uh, some strings that are touched and people won't be, won't be real. So youth of today, let's go back to the, to the old foundations of marriage and the old trainings. Those things, they still work a lot. Today, we want to do things in our own way. Hence, the, the divorce rate is so high because we can't be taught. Let's, let's, let's admit, like our brother gave an example of, let's admit and learn things from, from, from people that have experience in, let's pick families that we can see, um, friends that we can see that these guys, they are actually doing well in their families. They have principles that they've put on the table that they are following, unlike being proud of ourselves, which doesn't help in any way. Thank you. I thank you the Gardens Church. Okay, Zolana, I'm gonna give you now the opportunity to respond um, to some of the questions or comments that come through, and then Esther will come through with further comments and questions, and I'll give to other hands that I see here. Now, I do understand that, um, we, we, we've got a lot of comments happening and it's going to be quite busy. So we'll do our best to make sure that we control the situation as much as is possible. Now, if you do feel Zolani during the time a question is asked that you're not comfortable with asking, answering the question, just don't, don't do that. Don't put yourself on the spotlight. We will protect you with all that we can. I'm muting you now. Go ahead, my man. Take us through. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know what? So, so, so the three questions, I mean, um, uh, the first one is, did you contribute to the divorce? I think it's it's very tricky to balance it out and say that uh, we both did it. I think um, we both had our own sort of contributions to the breaking up of the marriage. I did speak about it earlier and said, um, you know, I said that 
we, to the demise of any marriage, I think, or any relationship, there's, there's always accountability on both sides. So I can't sit here and say that she did or she didn't. I, I just know that we couldn't find middle ground uh, and our inability to find middle ground um, meant that we both had contributed to that, to that point. So I think I'm not gonna say that she did and I'm not gonna say she didn't. That's just, it's just something that we, we just couldn't resolve the critical issues that had, had risen in our relationship. And, and remember, I wasn't married for a month, I was married for four years. So in that process, I think we both had events individually and as a couple, we, we, we just couldn't contribute in the right way to the marriage. Um, and for one party or both parties, funny enough, I didn't, <laughs> I'm not the one that, uh, that applied for the divorce. I, I went for the separation route and uh, a year later, she then decided to file for the divorce. Um, so, so you find that at a point when obviously I decided to then try and go through the separation in terms of cooling off because of we couldn't find each other. The other partner felt that it was better for us to officially call it quits. So I think we're both accountable for different um, sort of uh, uh, elements in, into where we are today. So, so I'm not going to say she did. I'm not going to say she didn't. I'm just saying we didn't find middle ground. And because we didn't find middle ground, we just couldn't carry on. The second question is, uh, as an Adventist, the beliefs, do I believe that there's things that we do as Adventists that, that almost injure uh, how we perceive marriage? I think this is one of the first discussions where, that I've seen, and it's just fortunate or unfortunate the fact that I'm the one speaking on, on this particular issue. I think we've never spent a lot of time uh, addressing the realities of what marriage looks like, the evolution of human beings in the marriage, the obligations of a man. I mean, we always speak about them high level, but we never really go um, and talk about what contributions each person should be bringing to the marriage. Uh, we speak about marriage uh, from a spiritual perspective and talk about how submissive a woman should be and how a man should be a provider. But we, we don't get to the nuts and bolts of, of what makes relationships and marriages work. And I think we've created a perception that the danger that I see, we don't have practical discussions about relationships and marriage. We talk about stuff from a spiritual perspective and set the spiritual bar, but we don't equip men or women in the church from a functional perspective to be the best version of themselves in a marriage and be the best partners. So I just think that if we, if we, if we got more knowledge uh, um, as, as young people about the requirements and what it means to be the head of a home, um, at what point should you feel that you're ready? What milestones should you set individually before you can consider marriage? Because the, the financial implication is one of the biggest pillars that I talk about a lot about when is it, when should a man consider marriage? And I know the discussion will always be about what if I'm unemployed and I'm talking about a, a person who's really, who can hold it down themselves financially, but cannot hold it down for two or three people in the home. So at what point should you actually now consider marriage at, at, in terms of your financial maturity? We speak about emotion, I spoke about emotional maturity. So there's so many things we don't speak about functionally that actually drive the level of confidence in a person to say, I'm ready to take care of another human being. I'm ready to be the head of a home. I'm ready to make these decisions as a leader. So we don't talk about the, the, the themes that go into marriage. We talk about marriage as the overarching idea. And then you go for marriage counseling, premarital counseling, and you find yourself, okay, find the pastor sitting there. He's telling you about sanguine. He's telling you about all these other things, but the nuts and the bolts don't really then come out. So, so I think, as a church, if we can design ourselves operationally when we prepare people for marriage to have the practical, practical discussions, a lot of stuff and a lot of divorced individuals will not even exist in the church. You know, and I don't know how. I think there are professionals in the church that, that are psychologists or marriage counselors, and they need to come forward and start adding value. I think the other thing is the expectation of ministers or pastors to actually have all the answers when it comes to all spiritual matters or all church functional matters is also a bit impractical. There are professionals in our church, the same way on the stewardship, they will find an accountant or someone who works in the finance field to come and speak about issues of stewardship in the context of finance. We need to start having practical discussions about marriage from people that deal with, us, with, with, with marriages and deal with psychology and deal with issues of the home or domestic issues on a day-to-day -day basis, get them into the space and prepare people. Yes, it might not be the most... Um, 
integrated or complete solution, but it would at least take a lot of couples 70% to preparation. And then people make decisions from there. Uh, I think those are one of the dangers and belief systems that I'm seeing in the church is that we don't go in depth when it comes to these very sensitive discussions. To the pastor earlier on, you can't, yes, if, if you told people about the realities of marriage, a lot of people would potentially not opt for marriage. Um, and the other truth about it is that I know of a lot of marriages right now where people don't want to be there, but they're together because of, of what would the church say or, or the financial implications of I got married in communities of property, but now how do I exit the marriage because of it's got a financial implication on me. So whether or not we like to have the, the sensitive discussions or not, the after effects of, of not having the sensitive discussions become more dire than actually us uh, trying to save these marriages. So I think the danger that I see is just the discussion, getting people prepared and using the right tools to get people prepared. I think that's one of the things that they really lack in the church. Marriage after divorce is a sin, uh, reconciliation. Well, I can tell you straight, reconciliation definitely is not gonna happen. I think <laughs> it's, <laughs> we've gone far beyond the reconciliation route. I think uh, my, my partner herself, has moved on with life and has, has pursued a marriage herself. So she is married again. I think that's public knowledge. It's not something I want to hide. So even if I wanted to, I'd literally have to go break up that marriage and then get married again. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not willing to, to, to do that. So I think I've done my research in terms of the views of the church on, on marriage again. And that's why I, I took a long time out to actually find myself and, and speak to, to, to my pastor friends and speak to elders in the church and say, is there an option that we can actually go this route? Now, that, that question has got a lot of implications on, on a, lot of, a lot of elements that have happened that led to the divorce. So I can't fully answer it um, to the best of, 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 or to the satisfaction of the, ask, of the person who asked the question, but I'm saying I've done all my research and in the context, I think I'm good to go. Um, and if I'm not, I think only time will tell. Okay, thanks so much for that one, Zolani. Okay, um, we, we're going to give over the opportunity to Ashley. Ashley's going to take us through a couple of questions. Um, they're quite a lot, though, so you can just note them. But please, can we just do this this way? It's not Zolani who's on the spotlight. So we're not, it's not the Zolani story that we are all about here. If you have a comment, have a question, have an answer to some of the things that probably are being asked here. Please, we invite you. I think fundamentally what you spoke about, and this is just to, to spice it up on this, you, you spoke about the fact that the church should start having programs. And in this platform where the leaders from different types of churches, uh, blah, 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 maybe we should start implementing such programs for the young people way before they even think about getting married. It becomes a bit more helpful to actually fix the problem before the problem uh, shows its ugly head right there. I think that's a very important thing there. Okay, my ash, my ash. Go ahead, yeah. No, sorry, Tal, if, if I can add, I think, so, so yeah, one, was, one would ask what do I suggest? Um, I spoke about in-laws, the involvement of my parents, the involvement of my ex's parents in the marriage. Um, we can go as far as, as part of the premarital counseling discussion, getting both families into the counseling session and drawing the boundaries around that in terms of what's their level of involvement, how to handle issues. And I, and I think that's one of the practical ways. We've got, we've got existing programs in the church from a, a ministerial perspective that when I want to get married, I go to a minister for counseling. Um, but how far do we take that? A well-researched and a well-thought process that says, okay, fine, these are the things to consider. Let's get the extended, let's get the families in also into the same room to have the discussion about these two people are getting married. What's your view? What do you think your level of involvement is? We speak about asking the critical questions of Zolani, are you financially ready for this community? Um, and let's, I'm going to use a name. Let's assume I was marrying and Tabi Singh. And Tabi Singh, what are your ambitions? So, so we can speak about belief systems and all this stuff, but where does Tabi Singh want to live in the next five to 10 years? Does she want to study? Does, how many kids does she want to have? And is that, uh, is that something that you guys can draw up a constitution that says post-marriage counseling, the constitution and the agreements look like X, Y, or Z. So that every time there is something that needs to be discussed in the marriage or in marriage counseling, we can always refer back to some sort of agreement or document. So there's quite a lot of things I think we can do um, in the church. How involved do we want to get into fixing this problem? I think that's, that's one of the routes we can take. Oh, I Thank you so, so much. much. 
Yeah. Uh, look, look, Kyla, as Bong and Foti, thank you so much for the powerful presentation. Um, maybe, Mta, before I, I go on to read the, the, the questions that we've got and some of the comments that are coming through, uh, I want to appreciate this, this, this platform, the 230 Conversations platform. I know that uh, certain times we've received concerns that we, we don't protect the speakers. Uh, but I think that it's the nature uh, of the platform. That, that's what happens when, when you're conversing and then people are applying their minds. So I don't think that any of our speakers are, are offended because I think we, we're receiving a bit of that as well uh, in respect of you, Zolani. But I'm sure that you're very comfortable to answer whatever questions are going to be posed. That being said, um, there is a, 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 a comment here that says that uh, the speaker, it, it says that the speaker um uh appears to to accept that he he engaged in premarital sex uh would he say so hey sorry man it's long so it, it says that so so the speaker appears to accept that he engaged in premarital sex would he accept that when you do that uh sex clouds the your judgment of your partner so this is now when you are speaking about your um your belief system that because you engaged in premarital sex, uh, it clouded your judgment of your partner. And so you would have ignored uh, these belief systems that you're referring to. Um, and that since she fell pregnant, you then rushed into the waiting without really knowing each other because you were clouded by the premarital sex. Uh, that's the one. The second one that is coming through uh, says that this person actually wanted to ask, but they, they're very uh, scared. They, they, they're shy types. Uh, they're saying there's something I'm not understanding and I don't think I'm bold enough to ask. Uh, was Zolani the one who walked away from the marriage? Uh, did he get the girl pregnant? If yes, uh, is he taking care of the child? I think most of this stuff you've already answered now. I think the part about uh, you opting for separation and uh, her subsequently filing uh, for divorce. So you may not have to uh, answer those. And yes, it's quite clear that there was a child. Uh, and I think what you now have to answer is your relationship with this child post-divorce. Are you taking care uh, of this child? Then we move on to Facebook. Hey, uh, ne, Facebook is very, very interesting. And please keep those questions coming uh, on Facebook and those uh, comments coming. So Lani, I'll run through these very, very quickly. Um, the first one comes from Notando Siziba. She says, belief system plays an important role. You don't need to note that. It's a comment. Uh, and here is Masiko. Masiko says that, uh, did you go for premarital uh, counseling? This is now, she posted this right at the beginning uh, of your presentation when you were talking about the, the challenges that you faced in your marriage and says, did you go for premarital counseling? Uh, and were some of these things not flagged or discussed? Um, and then Charles Matlatla says that the foundation determines the durability of the marriage irrespective of the bad weathers that will beat this marriage. So no need uh, to note that. And then Tando comes back and says, point to note, take time to invest in knowing your partner before marriage. Uh, Spoo Fire is there. This is your co-author. Uh, Spoo Fire says that uh, maturity is important. Marriage is not for kids, the pastor is saying. Um, and then Tando is back again, says most of the times people go into marriage counseling four weeks before the wedding day. Um, and then let me just see if I can rush to where they are pressing uh, questions. This is from Charles Mashata. I'd love to get your view on this one, Zolani. It says, are we not investing much energy and resources towards the wedding? Uh, and we are ignoring to invest uh, in marriage. I think you may already have touched on that. Um, Notando Siziba, no, Masiko says, Notando Siziba, very true. Maybe the church shouldn't be the one place that we go for counseling. Would you be amenable to that suggestion, Zolani, that we should approach other institutions uh, outside of the church uh, for pre-marital uh, counseling? And then uh, Cynthia has been pulling through with some interesting comments there on Facebook. She says that marriage shouldn't be undertaken for selfish reasons. Love is a principle. Emotions uh, should be regarded, but not uh, to a greater extent. Spoo Fire comes and says, is this church and parents who push us to marry cause of pregnancy? And it ends bad. Zolani, would you say that was the case, in, 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 that was the, the, the thingy, the challenge as well in your instance where you pushed 
was the uh, societal pressure from the church and from your family uh, to get married because you had now uh, impregnated the lady. Um, and then Matamela uh, says that compatibility is more than just looking good uh, together. Cynthia comes in and agrees and says, people think compatibility is wearing the same African attire. It goes beyond that. Uh, let me just see if there's any uh, other questions. There's a lot of comments, a lot of people agreeing with you there. Uh, so I'm gonna skip that. Nta, let's leave it here for now. There is, I've not attended to the questions and the chat in the Zoom chat section. Uh, but let's, I don't want to now, um, you know, overburden Zolani. Let's give him this for now. And then maybe at a later stage when you're comfortable in Tanda, so we can take care of the comments and the questions in the chat section on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, Ash, for that one. Much appreciated. Okay, fine. Let's take the next round of hands. We're gliding towards the end of our program anyway. It's been a beautiful one. And we're still learning quite a lot of things. And, I'm, and I need to protect the speaker again in a certain way that uh, I think it's not a Zolani show, so... Just trying to put him on the spotlight too much to ask him like so what's happening what are you what you're doing do you have a girlfriend now blah 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 all those kind of things i think let's try our best to make sure that we get the lessons learned and make more comments not to muzzle anyone the following hands are coming in the following order let's go joel of the pandemic and torren dix um valentine well, i think that's one of our stickers for july uh yeah those are the hands that i have here jolo Pandemize us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Zolani, for sharing uh, your life um, experiences to teach us some of the life's lessons about love, marriage, and divorce. Uh, and I'll realize that um, your presentation, because you're using your life's experiences uh, your presentation is largely, or to a large extent, is based on uh, divorce as a young person's perspective. So um, I just want to look at divorce at a later stage in life. Maybe for two people who've been, you know, in a marriage setup for 10, 15, 20 years, I don't know how late, I can't be later. But for people who've been in a marriage setup for quite a long time, uh, one pastor said when he was speaking to family life issues and looking at a couple who is considering divorce at a later stage, he says, um, sometimes uh, as a couple, you must get to a point where you admit that you yourselves as individuals and as partners in this marriage, you have failed to make proper decisions that could make your marriage work despite whatever issues will make you to consider divorce. Uh, because now that they are kids, you know, maybe your kids are now at university uh, because you've been together for such a long time and maybe you had kids when you started, uh, when, when marriage was still at an early life. Now that they are kids who are already at school, uh, it's okay to, it's okay to accept that you have failed, but still, stay in that marriage for the sake of kids growing up in a stable environment. Like you said, you were brought up by stable parents with both the physically present. So adopting that as well for the sake of your kids so that your kids will grow up in a stable environment and they can make proper decisions about marriage for themselves tomorrow. So I just want to find out what is your view thought on that cancel? Uh, for married people at a later stage who might not want to consider divorce as an option and uh, decide to accept that they have failed and stay for the sake of kids. Then later, when kids have grown up and are out of the house, then they can consider divorce at that stage. All right. Thank you so much, Henrietta. That's one of our speakers from last week. Okay, let's have who ends coming through. Zolan is noting the questions. Ends. Come through a Valentine, Ntoro, I see you, Lubanda, and Gardens. Let's go in that order. And hi, Mta. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think this is more of a passing well, comment um, to Zolane. Zolane, I, uh, thanks very much for sharing the story. I wish I'd met you. Sounds like you're a great guy. Uh, thank you for opening up to us. I think you having to get married at the age of 22. You must have broken many norms that were there. I'm sure you are the only one amongst your friends that actually took that decision. So you said you set a foundation. 
Is that a precedence that was not very famous being married at such a young age? And now coming here on this platform at um, this session and also sharing your story is also setting another foundation and another precedence um, before so many people. So I think there's a lot of us who are learning from this, taking down points that we are going to use. So you coming to this platform, basically my comment is you are touching a lot of lives that you might not be aware of. And so thanks for, the, for, for being honest and making yourself vulnerable, like the pastor said. I really wish I met you. And I'm sure out of this experience, there's a lot of, a lot of CVs that will be coming along your way, if you know what I mean. All right, cheers. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that one. And Slalim time, check it out, man. Trouble you're next. Let's go. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the speaker for your for your story. I just want to thank him as well. I think it's a it's a lesson um, not only to the unmarried, but even to us, the married. I was listening to his testimony. He touched on a on, a, on uh, very important things uh, that maybe I just want to emphasize. And I think <clears throat> one of them has to do with uh, the issue of um, the in-laws and the other one I think has to do with, with the issue of uh, the role of the church in, in, in all of this. Now I'm gonna start on the, on the issue of um, in-laws and um it is very true if um and now I'm, 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 I'm this is not a question this is a, a point to note now um one of the things that we 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 did the day we got married uh our pastor at that time i think it was pastor rousseau he did an illustrative example where my parents and her parents were holding candles and then the pastor asked that um, um, our parents give um, blow their candles off. And uh, that was a sign to say, now you guys, you are now consultants. Meaning to say that their roles had now changed from being parents to being consultants. Now a consultant, you are called, right? You just don't go and start giving advice i have to call you and 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 then i can ask you should i consult you should i should i should i get some advice from you you just don't come now that that aspect of in-laws involvement is either one of you has called them or the in-laws themselves have called in them in the marriage now that is an, a, a lesson um, um, to, to all who are married and those who want to get married. The role of the in-law is that they are consultants and it's up to you, you and your partner, where you are going to invite them. And not only that, but it stretches further to the sisters, the brothers, you know, um, um, their role, you know, they just, some, they just come and they just be asking money because they used to be asking money from their sister. They don't know that you know, the sister now has a role to play with the, new, with the new husband. You just don't go and ask money from them, you see. So um, I just wanted to, 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 to say thank you so much for raising that point because it is one of the critical uh, elements that, can, that do lead to involved, if not handled properly because um, it, it goes back to the issue of communication. Now, I don't want to keep on talking and talking, um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank, to thank him for, for, for that point. Um, and on the issue of church, I think on the issue of church, I want to differ with him a bit and say, uh, let's, be, let's, be, let's try and uh, come on guys, the church has done so much. In, if I am to compare with other churches, their programs when it comes to premarital marital counseling i think we are doing so much we are doing we are doing all the all that we can as a church in the defense of church i think the church is doing maybe we can improve i have no problems with that maybe we, we need there is room to improve but as it stands now i think the church is doing 
wonderful things. The the singles retreat, the 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 the, the married uh, uh, those who are married they have retreats. You know, uh, um, there is these discussions that we're having. Some churches don't even have these discussions. You know, I I give a practical example. We once invited someone from a Pentecostal church to a a marriage retreat sometime um, when we could travel. And they were like so amazed to say, your church actually does this. They didn't know that actually a church can organize such a thing. So in defense of the church, I think the church is doing a wonderful job in far as trying to educate us on how to, 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 to maintain our marriages and how to sustain our marriages. Yes, they can do more, but as far as what they've done so far, I think they've done a fabulous job. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you so much for that one, Valentine. I think um, uh, Valentine and, and his wife, Urut, I think they're brought here. They're gonna be coming through on the 31st of July to speak about the joys of, uh, of marriage couple goals. Togo, up to you. The following hands in Togo. And there's a new um, hand. So Umvanda and Gardens, you spoke already. So let me give Um Togo and quickly go to Uliqua, then Lubanda and Gardens, and we're gliding towards the end of our of our session anyway. So so let me keep 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 on uh, writing the questions and getting ready to give us your deliverables. Umto, show boy. Uh okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, but there's a bit of um, yeah, my PC is here and there. Am I clear? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Brother Zolan as well uh, for the presentation. Uh, mine is, is a question around uh, dating again after uh, maybe what do you call this? After a breakup, a separation, but in this case, uh, after a divorce. I think he touched on that, that he himself maybe tried it uh, a few times. But what caught my attention was the, the way he included there that he considered it to have been dating prematurely. Maybe if you can take us through that aspect, what makes dating again after a separation, a breakup premature? Is it the reasons that someone has to, to date again, or is it an, an issue of time factor? How long you take to, to date again? Because usually after a breakup, we know that we usually say, I can find another you in a minute. So I quickly move on to the next relationship, but uh, it might as a play that may probable come into play and then keep you uh, playing it low. Maybe if you can take us, especially through the reasons that he might have got that even maybe from his circle of friends, what usually can be the, the reasons that make someone dead and prematurely so? Probably it could be, is it someone who be testing whether they are still able to love again or there is, is it about trying to prove a point to the other partner? That you know, I can I can still do this thing uh, better than uh, you know. If he may actually try to take us through that an understanding of what he considers to be dating prematurely after such a uh, an experience. Okay, experience. Thank you. Okay, now thank thank thanks a lot for that one. Okay, you he's noted that one. Let me just go to Liqua. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me, Mto? Uh, sorry, Loud and clear. Mta. Loud and clear. Okay, um, mine is a question uh, based on external forces, mainly friendships, right? Uh, it, it doesn't only go to Zolani, I, I think it, it, it goes to everyone who's, who's here, who's married. I want to find out how do you navigate around the spaces of friendships, right? Uh, we know friendships play a, a, a huge role when it comes to our decisions and stuff from, from the time when we are contemplating marriage or when we're just dating, even in marriage. And we are advised to uh, have friends, more friends who are married than uh, not when, when, when you're actually married, right? So now how do you have to get around that space? Because it, when you're making friends, uh, establishing friendships, there are some uh, instances where you find, find that the, the person that you're befriending, the couple that you're befriending is a couple. They're not actually happy in their own marriage, right? They're going through, they're not in the 
best possible space to advise or uh, to 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 nurture your your own uh you guys as a couple right and to nurture your relationship it, 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 this this is this even goes to mentorships right um so how do you navigate around that space um Zolani mentioned that he married, got married at 22, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure his friends are not married, right? Now, mm -hmm. how did he navigate around that space? How did the friends influence and how did he filter out the good and the bad advice when it comes to that? How do you manage to do that? That's my question. All right. Okay, thank you so much for that one, Liko, for that. Okay, so the, the, the management of the friendship space um, is what's happening there. I think, I think what we probably get in again, I think Zulani, you probably need to touch on this. Um, you are, you correct me if I'm wrong, you're not saying that getting married at a young age is the ultimate disaster for marriage. Neither are you advocating the opposite to say getting married later is the guarantee for marriage, right? So I'm, you'll align with that. You're simply saying that at any particular point, way before the marriage starts, there must be massive preparation. And I must say this because there's a question that somebody just sent to me right now. It's a voice note, I won't play it, but let me just summarize what it's saying. In football, in athletics, you're saying both has to train for years on end for running for less than 10 seconds. That's a lot of preparation before the actual race. And this one we sent is in, 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 in the voice note me. So it's saying to me, how, how honestly can we have the church, the parents, the community coming together to have massive involvement in the preparation stage? Right? So it's, it's saying, is, is, is there a way of putting all these three fundamental building blocks of our social lives, our family, our, 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 social, our, in our community, the church where we belong to, uh, um, is there a way of coming up together and saying, listen, Mutana wants to start dating, Mutana wants to start getting married. So before he even gets to the, the pulpit, to the altar of marriage, let's start to be involved in his life in terms of preparation. I hear the idea that People, the church gets involved only when the door is opened unto them. But is there a way for the church to knock on that door? Not necessarily to wait for someone to open it, but to go and knock and say, hi, if you may, please do open the door for us. So that's pretty much what the question looks, looks at. It's a very sad comment that came from him. It's, it's very emotional in that because he says it, it, the people come from failed marriages and we are products of failed marriages and people that come from failed marriages sometimes really go ahead to fail marriages over and over again. It's a ripple effect, that's a mess out there. Lubanda, I'm giving you the opportunity. Go ahead, Lubanda Gardens, and then after that, Zoran will come through. Michaela, you're coming for the next round of hands, and then we're rounding it up from there on. Sure. I'll pick it up from there, boy. Um, but firstly, sure. let me acknowledge uh, the speaker, Uzolan. Abra, Mdala, Mkulu, Siabong Abra. Then, uh, Picking it from where you just left, we have perfect families and not so perfect families. So if parents of a perfect family and parents of a not so perfect family meet, what do you think will come out? Disaster. But you have a child from a perfect family and a child from a not so perfect family wanting to build a, their own family. So the honors now becomes, um, uh, the, the, the duty of the two to make their own family. It's true, our families want the best from us, but is the best for us the best for us because of the different backgrounds? Is the best for you? I find the best but Lina Loi too, you are the ones that have come together to create your own best. So while it's trying to, to, to merge families, let us not push them so hard because it will end in tears. Then the other point that I needed to address is, um, we are all at different stages of what the speaker was talking about. We have some that are not married, the some that are married, and uh, those that are separated, 
and some that have just divorced or that have divorced. Go ahead. Um, I don't know whether we've lost you or not. Um, okay, Amanda, you, you probably need to come through. Um, I really can't hear you. Your mind. Because okay, yeah, we're back. You're saying where did you lose me? I think the time when you were talking about that sound that um coming from perfect families, um, I think that was the second point from the first initial one, right? Yeah. Okay, I was saying the perfect point, the, 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 you, my family, your family wants the best for you and the family of your girlfriend wants the best for her. Did you get that point? Yes, we did, we did get that. So, yes, so actually what, the point that was, uh, that was driving it then is you should make a perfect family for your own. Because if, uh, the fact that both our parents want the best for us and the best for us may not be the one the best for us that they want from us may not be the best for the two of us it might end in tears mm -hmm. then the second i think we're really having some couple of difficulties with the network so let me just mute you for now uh, what you care has been talking about so boy um i'm really having a bit of some difficulties with hearing go ahead okay are you, are you hearing me now now we can <laughs> now we can oh i don't know where you lost me but uh, I, will, I will pick the second point yeah. um we are different stages of what the speaker has been talking about. There are some who are not married, some married, some who are separated, some who are divorced. To those that are not married, don't go into marriage with an, a glimmer or an iota of, of, of contemplating divorce because you have started brewing for divorce and what you will get is divorce. What you can actually do is to work towards what you want to achieve in marriage. And to those that are married also, do not fight and use a weapon of divorce as a threat. Because once you use it as a threat, the other person might use it, might not use it as a threat, might just walk away or might prepare themselves in walking away because they have seen with la at one point of the or the other we might separate so let me just start preparing myself for departure as well mm. okay it kills also the happiness of the family when you use um threats or when you when you suggest when you suggest uh, divorce as a means of solutions when you're not yet divorced. Because what happens is that it shuts all the other avenues of sol solving the issues. Mm -hmm. Like the speaker hey. was saying, there is a lot, lot our, our African system our African is, system is Open, open to such. Are you hearing me? I'm getting an echo from my things. Yeah, you know what? I, 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 we, 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 you can't, you come through, you can't, you come through. So let me just ask you to do this. Maybe if you can type your second point, that'll be more, uh, better. Um, I think we'd hit a uh, part of it. If you could just finish up on the typing, then I can be able to read it, um, on that. I think your network is bouncing off on and off like that. Let me just give to the next person. Sorry about that one. Once it's restored, maybe you can come through as well. The gardens, there you go. Um, cool, please do type, I really insist. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, I like what Lubanda said and what uh, your, the voice that, that, that you got earlier also was, was uh, alluding. Now, this is what I've seen with, uh, with us youths of today. Um, we, we, are, uh, we, we don't want to prepare the ground first. We just want to jump into marriage, and then after that, we our end result is if it doesn't work out, I bail out. Now um, we have beliefs, and of which I I meant to understand that um, the beliefs that we have actually 
they are they are kind of selected it's not everything that we believe in so when we we are we 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 are reading our vows to each other and saying um till death do us part that part is kind of um eliminated because there is this thing that is coming into picture now where people are now saying you know what if things don't work i'm divorcing you you understand so meaning that um this is personally what i i, I normally um would love to 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 get from a person that I'm, I'm intending to marry i'll ask you a question to say how do you understand divorce do you do you do you perhaps sometimes look at divorcing me if anything should go wrong and if your answer is yes i'll definitely end that relationship same time reason being um i have my values i have my beliefs that i i sit down and look at and one of which is God hates uh, divorce. He says it so in Malachi 2 verse 16. So now if you as a, as a Christian, as you call yourself, and um, you are kind of selective in, in the things that you believe in, I think you are playing, you are, you are playing a dirty game, I would call it. So let's go back to the, to, to, to the basics first. Let's prepare the ground and let's eliminate divorce in the picture from the get-go. Should things go wrong, we sit down and fix them. We talk about them, sort them out. Not should things go wrong, I'm divorcing. You're, you're actually challenging God and say, okay, fine, you hate divorce, therefore you're gonna hate me also because I'm going to divorce anyway. So use of today, let's let's change our approach to, 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 to marriage. Let's avoid this thing of, I'm going to get married. And then if you slap me, if you do this and that, I'm going to divorce you. Remember, the bigger picture here is God himself. He tells us straight, I hate divorce. And mm -hmm. we should delight in resorting to divorce should things go wrong. A small thing, we then resort to divorcing. He hates it. And if he hates it, there are repercussions that will follow after that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Gardens, for that one. I'm going to give over to Zolani right now. Um, okay, Gardens is bringing, um, throwing a, a spanner into the works now. So. So then what do we do if the relationship is not working? Um, do we stay because God hates divorce? What's, what, uh, what, what are we winning there when we can't stand one another? I think so I'm trying to put across an idea earlier on to say, could he have done something to, to, to solve the relationship, to, to avoid it falling apart? Yes, probably. Maybe both of them could have tried something. Maybe a change of character would have done it good, but that didn't happen. And what happens when those things don't end up happening, right? So that's, this is why maybe, critically speaking, we have such a discussion. Speaking about divorce within the context of the church, the very place where divorce should not happen, but is currently happening. And it brings again a mystery, because then we can talk about how sin came into heaven when sin should not be in heaven. So those are the kind of things that we need to talk about further on. There's Zolani, respond, my man, I've got three hands coming up after you, then we're gonna, gonna conclude from there on. Thank you so much for your patience. Facebook family, you're on fire. Ashley, give me your hands up if there's anything coming from Facebook there and all that. So then just one more question again that came from my, to my, um, to my, to my inbox here. Yeah? Somebody says, okay, so is, this is um, an SDA like me and you. Is, is marriage the intended ideal for all Seventh-day Adventists? In other words, I'm here, you're here, there's a girl in church, I'm there, social life is pushing. Is the intention at the end of the day, is the, the end game, is the entrance or is the arrival, the show that we all arrive in, both coming from different places, should the show always be marriage? Or there's another option to all of that. Okay, go ahead, I'm unmuting it. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Um, yeah, I've been <laughs> quite a lot of questions here. Um, so I'm gonna start at the beginning. I'm gonna try and answer them to the best of my knowledge. Um, and then we've got, yeah, I'd, I'd love to also answer the gardens one. Very interesting perspective, the reality of obviously. Premarital pre sex, uh, did it cloud my decision-making? I think um, I was, you know, this is a very, uh, one of the elements, right? So, so sexual intercourse has got a way to connect you to another human being, right? And, and, and 
it's it's something that does have a huge influence on obviously what steps you take next as a relationship. So so I'd be lying if I said uh, the sexual um, uh, intercourse element was not a key driver. It 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 played a huge role. Um, it, I didn't consciously make the decision to marry her based on. On, on the sex, but I mean, it played a huge role in terms of where we ended up. Um, so when you're intimate with someone, you really do connect on, on all levels. So I think it had a huge influence. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the one question. Um, separation, uh, am I supporting the child? Yeah, definitely I am. I think I do get access to my child um, continuously. And I think that's where the co-parenting discussion then comes apart, about to say that, how do we find a mutual ground to actually raise the child? So I think, one of the things we've done, we've done very well over the years. It hasn't been easy, but I think we, we, we're trying to put the interest of the baby at heart. I mean, for us, uh, as I said to you, my daughter is 11 years old right now. To those that know my child, she's, she's developing nicely. She's a child who's very confident by nature. Um, we won't get in 100% right, but I think we, we, we're trying. I think, she, I think one, thing that I always, one, one thing that I always tell my family is that um, irrespective of our differences between myself and my, and my ex, it, it, she's still a great mother uh, because of we didn't agree as partners doesn't automatically make her a bad mother and and so that's one thing i'm always grateful for and she knows that i always tell her that that she's a she's a phenomenal mother uh, when i look at the confidence levels of my daughter it i mean it's not because of me she spends 98 percent of the time with the mom because they live together so i think we try and co-parent the best way we know how those are always the advantages of of, of of a divorce is that you really do part ways also with, 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 with the child in some way or form. You try and close the gap the best way you know how. Um, so, so I'm also trying to play my part the best way I know how. It hasn't been easy over the years, but I think we're trying to make headway in that space. Um, the other question uh, is, are we investing in the wedding day or the actual marriage? Yeah, so we, we pumped in a lot, of, a lot of focus and a lot of money into the wedding day to make it, to make that point of entry very glamorous and very beautiful. And it's not wrong. It's not wrong to, to really invest in your wedding day. It's not wrong to actually show the world your vision and your expression of love for each other. I think everybody wants to look back in time with all things being perfect of their wedding day, the day they literally said, I do. Um, you don't want to look back on your wedding day and feel like you robbed yourself. I think you, to the best of your capability, you want to invest in the wedding day so that it's a point of reflection. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a crossroad. It's a moment of reflection. It's a moment of, of two lives coming together. You want to look at it and say, we had a beautiful wedding day. So I think, do we invest more in the wedding day? Yes. I think a lot of times we do speak about this in the church that we focus more on the wedding day than the marriage. I think, yeah, that's where we get, we, we do get it wrong sometimes. But I think today's discussion is, is a practical one that says, how do we balance out every element when it comes to relationship? How do we make sure that we, we, we influence two people that are coming together to build a, a home and to build a life together that can have an impact on the on the society that they that they exist in, and I think the discussion I think that the pastor mentioned this earlier to say that the ch no it wasn't the pastor it was Mr Valentine that mentioned earlier on to say the church does have tools and we do very well as compared to other denominations and I think that's where for me I'm I'm not totally saying that the church is incapable has shown incapability uh, is it, it could be personally when I had certain expectations of the church, they were not necessarily met. Is the church useless? No, I don't think so. I don't think the church is useless. I think that there's quite a lot of work that needs to go into uh, being able to package ourselves and our programs to be relevant for this particular time, the dynamics that we currently live in right now. I mean, we live, people always talk about the fourth industrial revolution. We, we live in, an, in a world right now where technological platforms or social media platforms drive a lot of decision making. So, so you, you find a, a way to, we need to find a way to communicate in the current landscape with the current sort of audience in the perfect way in, 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 in the current context. And I think that's where the shortfalls will always come. How do we address issues the best that we know how in this current context? And I think I'd love to see the church evolutionizing its programs to always keep up with uh, the, the landscape that we're in right now. So how do we package our programs to make sure that they're able to touch the youth practically so, and really educate us on critical elements into our lives. And I think that's, that's one critical point from my side. Um, other institutions for marriage counseling, definitely. I think you need to have a balance of both the spiritual and, and, and the functional. So, so 
as I mentioned earlier, we do have professionals who exist in the church. Maybe they have not put up their hands in terms of, of, of really serving the church in this context um, and, and making sure that they bring in their knowledge base and their capabilities into the church to actually close certain gaps. So do I fundamentally believe that given the chance, failing which that the church is not able to provide, you should seek external sort of uh, counseling that has got a well-balanced sort of approach because I think professionals will be able to uh, approach this thing uh, unpacking the psychological elements of a human being, the social elements of a human being, areas that, that the church is not able and, and is not trained to actually sort of drive points through. So, so I think the church is great on, on building up marriages and getting people ready from a spiritual perspective and having certain elements through research brought in from, from the circular world. But I think one of the critical things is there are professionals that are trained to actually do this and assess us as human beings holistically and, and address us socially in terms of two people coming together. So I would definitely encourage yes, going outside the church if, 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 if you're gonna go to a person who's well vetted, who's got your best interest at heart and make sure that they give you the right sort of uh, tools to actually uh, build up your relationship. Um, yeah, so we put, did, was I pushed by families to get married? I think it, it was, a, when I look back, it was a state of panic for everyone, right? So we now had to, had to make the landscape suitable enough for this child who's coming and make sure that we, we build a family enough to make sure that the child grows in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a fair sort of environment. Both families came together and they, and they agreed. And, and I think, when I look back on it, right, I, I can never hold the families into full account in terms of the final yes or no. I think in the state of panic, um, when the suggestion came up and I wanted to do right by my partner and by her family and by my family, the, the, the default and, and the organic decision was to obviously get married. So they might not have, have made me say yes or made me say no, but I think one thing that they did was is they created the platform for the for the no to potentially not exist. So I think one of the things that we we we, we when I look back retrospectively that that the families did, I don't think they they gave themselves enough time to actually unpack this thing and what it means to the end. But again, I was I was 22, but I was old enough to yes or no. I think that's one critical component. So so for me, I, I think the families were a critical component, but I can't fully hold them accountable for that. I think at the end of the day, it's myself and my partner that had the, the discussion. Um, John of the pandemic asked divorce for all the people. Um, the, the question is, right, so this happens a lot um, around families staying together because of kids. And, and it's a difficult discussion. It'll always be difficult. I always, I always think, and I always say to myself, and I always say to, to people that are close to me is that, any relationship should bring out the best version of you. You must be able to function socially, emotionally, and mentally, and really put out an image that really your children will be able to benefit from. One of the things that made me separate was I, was, I, was, I knew that I was not able to function holistically to a point where my daughter could reflect on the positive side of her father. There's certain environments which become so difficult, and I'm not gonna use the word toxic, but so, so unbearable that when you can take a good person and put them in a bad situation, they're not gonna be able to express the best version of themselves. And I, I think children are not stupid and they're, they're not, they're not um, 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 uh, brain dead. I think they can pick up on emotional absence. They can pick up on situations which are not emotionally healthy. And as they get old, and I've picked this up with my daughter, she's very emotionally aware. Um, and she's able to assess and read a situation more than most adults would be able to. So I think the question is, what, what type of environment or what type of, of image do you want your kids to take away into their older age? Do they want a mother who's depressed, who locks herself in the bedroom as soon as she gets home? Or do they want a picture where they come home and both parents are happy to be in the same space and share the same space and really are able to, to create an environment of health for the children? As I said earlier on, I saw my parents 
uh, build a sustainable home for us. Uh, an example would be every time my dad, my mom would be, I mean, close, my dad would be right there in a conversation with them. That's one of the love languages that I was exposed to from a very young age. I knew through certain things that my dad wanted to be there. Did he have his mistakes? Yes, they had their challenges, but I knew there was nothing that I could pinpoint and say, my parents wanted to be a part in some way or form. I grew up in a stable home and I know what stability looks like. So if at a very young age, I had the confidence and the ability to interpret what love looks like, I think with kids also, if you are now living in an environment where you're forced to be with each other, where you sleep in the same bed, but don't want to be there, kids are able to pick up the emotional distance of both parents. So I think it's a decision that you would need to make honestly, if you're willing to live with the repercussions of that, then I'd say definitely go ahead for the sake of the kids. But also what message you're sending to them is really the fact that um, it's okay to live in an unhealthy situation as long as it's benefiting someone else. And I'm saying that's a debate that we can have till, till kingdom come. I think it's a very tough one. Personally, I wouldn't do that. I, I wouldn't suggest that. But I mean, the church would have a different view, right? So <laughs> it's a very difficult discussion. It's neither a yes or a no for me. It's more of saying, what are you as an individual willing to live with, even when the questions come into the future? Because the question will come from one of your children who happens to be confident and say, but why did you stay when it was bad for you? I didn't ask you to stay for me. It's not, it, it's mm -hmm. not as if I potentially would not have survived it. So the questions will come. I always tell people, I say, if you're willing to live with the questions that your kids will have for you in the future, and you're able to be confident in the fact that you'll be able to answer them 100%, then make the decision that you want to make. But if you know that this is not where you want to be, it's not adding to your spiritual health, it's not adding to your, to your, to your, to your social health. If, if things have, and I, I, mean, I mean, this is where the discussion with, with the guy from Gardens becomes very sensitive. I'm saying, we, we need to be in environments where spiritually, um, God can never be doubted as a practical God. So for me, I'm saying, mm -hmm. does God want my mental well-being in my spirit? be a priority does god want me to be emotionally stable in my walk with him and those are all questions that i might not have answers to i'm saying i don't want to be I, did, I didn't want to be the guy that comes to church stands in the pulpit pretends that things are okay when they're not some way or form i mean people will find out of the destruction of my of my home front i i want to stand in front of people and be confident that what i am is what i am and if I stood in front of the church, knowing very well that my situation was not great, but yet I'm expected to give a sermon on salvation, is that fair? Is that a fair sort of, sort of viewpoint? So, so yes, God hates divorce. And I'm not advocating for people to get divorced yet. I'm saying at that particular point in time, I made a decision which I felt was best for my mental sanity, for my emotional sanity. And then obviously if I'm the best version of myself going into the society, I'm able to be a better father, I'm able to be a better brother, and a better partner, potentially someone, I'm able to be a better um, member of the church. Um, so, so it's really neither here nor there. I think it's, a, it's an easier default position to say God hates divorce because that's the spiritual answer. The functional answer for me is I was struggling emotionally, I was struggling mentally, I was struggling sort of socially in some way or form. Is that the best version of myself? You know, so it's neither here nor there. And that's why I can never stand in front of people and say, get divorced or get married. I'm saying I made the best decision that I knew I could make at that particular point in time at my young age. Yes, have I suffered repercussions? Definitely. I mean, the absence of my daughter in my day-to-day -day life is not something that I'm proud to be, right? And that's the price that I've had to pay about making premature marital decisions because it didn't end only with the fact that I got divorced. It's, as I mentioned, it started with me romanticizing something that I should not have romanticized. It started with me not having the standards, not having the, 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 the view of what marriage, these things, it's a buildup. The divorce is just the result of poor decision-making over years. It's not, the divorce is not an event that just suddenly abruptly, it's got a foundational impact of what actually led up to this particular point. So I think it's almost unfair to say, continue being married, even though it hurts you, it, even though it's painful to you, it, even though it's a difficult thing. I'm saying to people, if you want to avoid divorce, here are the tips. Um, uh, do a compatibility test, do a background check on the family, uh, check where you are emotionally, 
Um, where are you financially? Because finance is also a critical point in relationships, right? So, so you have to literally have a tick box of saying, okay, fine. What goals do I need to meet before I can say I do to someone else? As soon as you say I do to someone else, you are literally bringing someone else into your space, especially when you're a guy. If you're a man in a marriage and a relationship, the expectation of provision and provision you taking someone else who was eating nicely, a car, who was okay financially being supported by her dad and whatever the situation was, and you bringing them into your space where she must now rebuild her life or struggle all because of the name of marriage. I'm saying that's also an unfair expectation. I'm saying there's certain preparation points that one should actually go through before considering uh, um, getting married, considering bringing someone into your life because of relationships are eternal. They're meant to be forever. But they can't be they can't be forever on the wrong foundation. They need to be forever on the right foundations. So, so what do I advocate for? I don't advocate for divorce. I advocate for the right decision making leading to something that's meant to be eternal. Because of I didn't follow that, it then led to certain outcomes in my life. Compatibility being one of them. My ex-wife is a phenomenal human being. She's she's a great human being in her own right, in her own corner. I'm a I'm an okay guy. You know, probably people think I'm an okay person functionally, right? And, but her being phenomenal, me being phenomenal, doesn't mean that we have the same belief systems. It just meant that we liked each other, how we looked and how we thought, but on the deeper stuff that drives the sustainability of relationship, we couldn't agree on. And as soon as fundamentals are not the same, it's the same thing when we talk about our, our fundamentals in the church. If I stood in front of people now and I started talking the way you know what, I believe in the dead or I believe in, in ancestors. That's a, that's a fundamental that should lead me back to actually now the baptismal class. The same concept. If I come into a relationship with someone and we fundamentally disagree on fundamentals and principles, the foundation of the relationship becomes questionable. So, so that's one component that we need to discuss. Uh, dating prematurely. I was asked the question, when did I know that I was dating prematurely? I knew that I was not ready to date when I was sitting in a date and I was thinking about my ex-wife. That's the practical truth. On my first date, I knew that I was not ready to be there because of I compared my date to my partner or to my ex-wife. And I started trying to see the mistakes or trying to say, okay, fine, yeah, she sounds good, but will she also do the stuff that my ex did or whatever that happened in my marriage? So I knew that I was not ready because I had not yet healed. So the premature dating says, I'm now benchmarking two people against each other, one that I didn't work out with and one that potentially things. And as soon as you benchmark it, you're not ready to, to actually build a life because every time in that relationship, what's going to happen, you're always going to compare. Will she do the same? Will we disagree on this? And sometimes it's unfair. That's why I say bringing someone else into your world um, prematurely means that they must bear the cross of historical decisions or historical burdens that you are coming with. I knew that I was not ready to date because of, I was not ready to forgive half of the things that happened to me in marriage, right? And I was not, I was not able to look beyond and say, this person is different to where I come from. As soon as I was like, you know, by a fan of all, I knew I was not ready. So that part of the counseling process, I needed to go through the detoxing process of saying, you know what, people are not all the same, you know? And, and it would be unfair for me to expect that this is also gonna end in tears. I need to give people a fair chance. I need to believe in love again. I need to make sure that yes, as much as I didn't follow the fundamentals properly, that this time I do the groundwork and I do it with the right person. Do I have huge expectations of my, of my partner right now? Yes, I do. And she's very aware of that. She's, they are very aware of the fact that I'm, 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 I'm setting the standard high, but I'm not just saying I'm expecting that person to be this. I'm also trying to step up to the plate and say, okay, fine. What do you want? What do you want to see in me? Where do you want? I, we have the practical discussions. Where do you want to live? What do you want to drive? What do you want to eat? How many kids do you want to have? How often do you want to travel? How far do you want to take you? I'm now at a point where I'm saying, I've covered the spiritual and I'm having the practical discussions right now with, with the relationship that I want to go into. I'm saying, I'm going to the granular point. I'm even investigating how close she is with the mother. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But, but, but I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to drive to a particular point in to say that there is a way in which someone can actually correct the wrongs of the past by trying to do it right. There are people that got into situations that they didn't mean to get into. 
there is a way to correct it if you're in the same shoes that I am. All I'm saying is that I didn't follow the fundamentals. I didn't build up to this thing correctly. And I now have to live with the outcomes of that. But am I now going to stay in my corner and cry the whole time and, and pine and whine uh, like I'm six years old? I'm not. I'm going to pick myself up. I'm going to rebuild my life. And I'm going to move on with my life. And I'm going to create an environment where my daughter is proud of her mother, is proud of her father, even though they're not together. The next question is, external forces, how do you navigate around friendships? This is a big one for me because um, <laughs> when, when I should have been home at critical points in my marriage, um, I, was, I was yearning to be doing things that young men should be doing, right? So th the friendship part is a huge influence because the landscape and the environment that they create is, is something that you necessarily can't control. And that's why uh, Pastor Spoo speaks about it and says that uh, marriage is not a young man's game. And that's why we speak about self-development and self-discovery. There's a lot of emotional influence in a young man. You, you want to explore, you want adventure, you want quite, you live in a very unpredictable environment. You don't want to be in a space where you are in the house, but your mind is somewhere else or emotionally you're absent because of people your age are doing X, Y, or Z. You need to get to a point, and I'm, in no way am I saying that marriage is for old people. I'm saying as you enter a relationship, understand the things that you're walking away from and be comfortable that you will not be able to do certain things. So being forced into relationships and friendships with other married people is also unsustainable because yes, to the point that someone else made that there are other unhappy people that are married that potentially wanna be friends with. And you need to be careful and very selective about people that you bring into your space. But marriage is about making conscious decisions about certain elements in a, in a human being's life and saying, if I'm gonna get married and I need to bring the best version of myself to my partner and to my children, I must understand that I can't now decide that I'm gonna go you know, partying or whatever on the weekends and I'm gonna leave on Saturday night and come back on Sunday morning. It's literally saying I'm walking away from everything that I used to do as a young man and even the desires thereof, even the thought thereof to actually embrace this new life. And, and, and that's why it's very difficult for young couples to get married is because we think that being married still means I can keep and I can hold on to my former life. And not to say that it's wrong, but you must literally divorce. Okay, no, sorry. You must actually let go of the things that potentially are going to be contrary to what you're stepping into. Marriage is about bringing two people who are going to be together forever. And that means that there's certain things you can, it means you must go shopping together if you have to. It means you must, everything, when, you, when you're coming together, you're literally being one. You must be able to it's tolerate hours. each other in every sort of situation, whether it's socially, whether it's at church, whether it, you must be able to live with the picture that this is the person you're going to wake up next to, this is the person you're going to come home to. This is the person when you leave the house in the morning, you're going to leave and potentially eight hours later see. When you get to work, you must call this person. You must pick this. So you're living your entire life with this person. And if you're not ready to do that forever, then you're not ready. So I fundamentally think that the question that people need to ask themselves as they go into relationships and, and marriages is, are you ready to welcome someone and all their baggage and all their belief systems into your world? Someone said um, um, pre preparation and, and someone spoke about preparation. And, and I, think, I think that's one of the things is that preparation says we have the honest discussions. What is it that's in your life right now that you are now having to let go to enter this institution? Because the practical discussions is if you're someone who's still in love with certain things that only single people should be doing and you're thinking you can balance those out in marriage, it becomes very difficult. So you must be able to get to a point where you're mature enough to say, okay, fine, I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of doing that. I'm ready now to live with someone else. Yeah, so I think, I don't know, Mta, have I answered these questions or not? I'm not really sure. Listen, man, you did well. Much appreciated. Let's have the last round of hands. I know it's been, it's been hectic, man. <laughs> remember, remember our discussion prior to this to say, listen, it's going to be packed. And yeah. I, hope you saw, I hope you saw what we're talking about. All right, got three hands only. After those three hands, we give over to Ashley. Ashley, I think you should take it up for the comments. Then Zolani gives us the deliverables. And then I give the announcements. And then we, we end up. There's a question that came through that um, Ulubanda, the one who got cut off by network. 
um, a marriage that could be part of your deliverables. Um, does Zolani have any marriage tips? Right? I think pretty much you, you did quite a lot of justice to that. But if there's anything else that you could give, apart from what you gave, that would be very nice. That's what came from Ulubanda right there. Makele, Michelle, Ushuni, come through. Makele. Hello, Michael, you're unmuted. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, beloved. Uh, thanks for this amazing program that you have arranged for us, and we are learning so much from it. Um, eh, on the comfort of my bed. Um, <laughs> eh, eh. Your, your, your subject is very interesting and I love it. Um, what I've learned is in my entire 11 years or 12 years of marriage is that um, um, the way we grow up has a very impact on, on, on our future sometimes. And um, the, way, the way we grow, sorry. Okay. Um, are you okay? Um, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to say um, the way we grow or the way I grew up is that a, a child is raised by a village. And if you grow up with that mentality, um, it has helped some of us to say every elder, el every elderly is supposed to reprimand you one way or the other. It's not only your parents. And that, that has helped some, some of us to be better people or better men today. And we are able to, to accommodate every advice, every uh, reprimand from an, an elderly, be in marriage or not. Now, um, when, when one, when one in, in a church uh, set up wants to get married, uh, um, I've learned that the environment, the environment that, 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 that one needs to have needs to be very, very con conducive in a sense that uh, you need to live around people that are able to talk to you. We should have good relationships so that we are able to advise one another and when we see people that uh, people uh, uh, um, forming new relationship, we are able to come in into, into such people. That is why I started with saying, uh, if 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 a village was part of your life when you were growing, it's very easy to 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 welcome uh, uh, new people in your life when you, uh, as you grow up. Now in the church setup. That thing is, is practical as well, that um, uh, when you grow up and you want to have a relationship, uh, looking forward to, to, to marriage, um, that helps you. It opens door. You don't need to have a time when you, where you say, now I'm opening doors or my doors are closed uh, for whoever to say anything to us for, to, for advice. It, it needs to be an open door. 24 seven for everyone to be part of your life so that whenever they see something that can help you grow, it's easy for them to throw it, for, to throw that at you. And, 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 and it, 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 it builds a relationship. It makes life easy as well. Marriage counseling. Yar, um, uh, I've learned that uh, lately, maybe in the past, I don't know, but Lately, marriage counseling are just done as a formality. Um, people are still divorcing after 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 marriage counseling because I feel that um, they might not have done or given a proper guideline, or else it's either people start and stop, or or. We are quick, we want this thing to come, we're canceling quickly. Uh, uh, 
uh, and the date is tomorrow or next week. We don't even finish canceling. So I feel as well that uh, those who are conducting um, this counseling, they need to, make, to stand up and protect themselves and take pride in counseling to make sure that before marriage, uh, uh, you have really done your, your part to protect what God has created. Because this institution is not ours. Uh, it's, it's God's, it, it's created by God and God, God wants us to enjoy mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, gift of life. But now mm -hmm. because of the way we conduct it, we end up not really enjoying it because we rush. We don't take time in learning how God would want us to, 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 to engage or get involved in, in into marriage. Uh, feelings, mm -hmm. we, we depend too much on feelings uh, um, thinking that feelings uh, won't change because they change. When they change, divorce comes in uh, if, if you're not well gutted. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'm, just, I'm just talking as, as, as on the points that I've, I've noted here while people are speaking, although those that came into my head that uh, divorce, you know, I've, I've learned to, to appreciate the, uh, these words. When God was saying a, a, a man and a woman would leave their parents and cling together. I think somehow we are still missing that, that message. What it means to cling from parents, our understanding from us as uh, uh, people who are getting married and our parents or our families. We need to understand what that statement means. It means I need to live with my, life, with my wife, start our own life the way we want to. When we want, when, 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 when difficulties come, then it's easy for us to invite our elders to say, elders, we are going through tough times now, please help. But you find that parents, uh, they still want to control, drive our marriages the way they want, or they think they know what is best for us. While, while this was supposed to have happened before that, uh, Nwanaka as my son, as my daughter, this is how life is. Because some other, some, uh, the other thing that uh, Zolani said is he grew up in a, in a lovely family. Uh, that as well, it's an example and, and it, it guides a, a, a kid as to how do you take care of your wife? How do you take care of your husband? What do you do to your wife, your husband? It has, has a great impact on, on your child's life as well. And the way, the way we grow as children, if you're not able to take care of your sister and you grow, it's going to be very difficult to take care of your wife. If you don't take yeah. care of your brother when you grow up, at some stage, it's a, it's a problem to take care of your husband. So our growing nature or growing a, a, a journey has a very important role or impact in, in marriage, you know, understanding yeah. how we need to handle each other in marriage. Okay. Um, 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 vows. Vows. Like, I'll, I'll have to kind of like um, cut you up because I think Zulani is all right out of a bit of a time here and there are still a couple of more hands. Um, but you can just give the vows point. I don't know if you can be the last one and then maybe you can uh, pull through the after scenes program where Zolani will be done with the program, but we can still talk after scenes. It's pretty open for that. Maybe you can just take okay. us through the vows. I'm sorry to kind of like cut you off from there. No problem. Uh, the vows. Um, do you know I've learned to appreciate the vow that sits until death do us apart in, 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 in sickness and in health. Uh, 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 when we say these vows, uh, it's clear. They are very clear. They are very clear. But when, when, when problems come, we forget about these vows. 
Because now we've got our interests, uh, we've got uh, our emotions are high. We don't invite God. God, uh, this is this is this is your institution. Guide me now. Uh, how how do I handle the situation? Vows when 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 God says uh, until death do us apart, it means in any situation, in any situation. If if if, if there was a, if there was another situation, then it could have said, okay, until death do us apart. But in case that, but because it's clear, it says no matter an, in any other situation, we need to humble ourselves. Uh, we need to sacrifice. We need to have a different attitude in, 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 in issues in our differences. Uh, be able to change for somebody else for the sake of your relationship. The problem is we don't, have, we don't want to accept our, our, our differences in the relationship to say, if you're not happy, let me build this. Let me bring this to be part of our lives so that we are happy. We have a mutual understanding mm -hmm. that I brought this person into my life for him to, uh, for us to live together. So that, 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 that vow, you know, it has built me so much that uh, in, in whatever that mistakes is that we do, we need to remember that yeah. we need to work towards that. Thank you, my okay. brother. Uh, uh, yeah, I had, I, okay. The, okay, can I just say on this one of friends? Friends, when, when you uh -huh. come to- Oh, I'm you stretching it, my man. <laughs> just, just second, just second. <laughs> the one of friends, uh, it's important you remember that when you bring somebody else into life, things need to change and you need to teach your friends, okay, guys, they are born and now things have changed. So it means our time will be limited, irrespective of whether they are married or not. But when you teach them, your life makes it, it, it it's easier and your wife understands that if you are gone, he knows you are back and you still have his time. Uh, time. Thank you, my friend. All right, thank you, Michael, for that one. You know what? You need a tender. You need a 230 conversation tender. We should give you <laughs> an opportunity to say what you need to say. All right, in quick succession, the following three hands, please do make it as quick as possible. Michael, hit the Jews book of records here for the longest comment on the 230 conversations. <laughs> Let's go ahead, Michelle G. You're next up. Let's go. Hi, guys. I think for me, um, it's just a recommendation. Um, you know, when Azolani was speaking, where he said um, he started fantasizing things when he met the woman of his dream, this gorgeous lady, is the moment you start thinking that this might be the one and I want to marry that person. Before you go do the Lobola thing, go start the marriage counseling. Um, for It worked for my husband and I. We did that. And what it did for me, it basically took away the crazy ideas that I had of Cinderella, of the things that I had watched on TV and may, taught me of the things that would be expected of me as, as, as a wife. So mm -hmm. as, as soon as I realized that that's the journey that we wanted to take before even in, in involving uh, the parents for, for Lobola or engagements and all those things, I then knew or I started adjusting my life and start thinking differently in preparation of what was required so that I would know if I was ready or if I was not ready for, for, for such things. Such, you can't practice everything because obviously you won't be staying with that person, but there are certain ways of thinking, consulting with somebody before you do something that start creeping in uh, from, from those marriage counseling. So my recommendation, try marriage counseling before you even do Lobola because there's no pressure of, of moving on and trying on. That's it from my side. Thank you, Michelle. Short and sweet, beautiful. Try marriage counseling before the lower comes through. Shuni, go ahead. So, Chazo, uh, first of all, thanks to, uh, to Zolani for that beautiful presentation. Uh, it really opened up a lot of, uh, of areas where, as young people, we have uh, left uh, uncovered, you know, and there is the rush. I want to speak about uh, the influence of, uh, of, of of social media or just influence in the world, especially amongst young people in dating, uh, that that is that that is a problem. What I've seen is a trend is that you find um, uh, people that have not healed getting into relationships and wanting to keep score with its current relationship for their previous relationship. You know, hear someone saying no. Uh, I, I I feel at peace now. You are so much better than my partner, uh, than my that, than my previous uh, partner, and everything in danger. And as much these things will sound, um, they will sound so beautiful that someone 
says you are better than where they were before. I think also that speaks to like red flags that this person is not yet fully over their past relationship because they are benchmarking it. And you may not, may not realize this because you are now only supposed to be better than the other person so much that you may, you may fail to be yourself or, fa or feel so much under pressure to, to get, uh, uh, to, to be better than the other person and end up really getting depressed because you always want to outdo someone who is actually not there, but is existent in the mind of your partner. So I think as young people, we just need to heal. We just need to really go through healing and go through seasons of healing and disturbed healing where we really get over our past relationships and deal with them accordingly. So that when we enter new relationships, we give them uh, the fair chance that they need, you know, and not also factor in time. Uh, recently, mm -hmm. I just saw a post on Facebook, someone is saying, uh, and, 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 this, and this post gets like many shares, crazy shares, and, and many people who do not subscribe to these beliefs, they get, uh, they get attacked, you know, uh, someone be like, um, uh, you know, when I met my wife, when I met my girlfriend, I knew in two days that this one, I want to marry her. Uh, and then you have people saying, yeah, I dated someone for, for like five years. And then I met my partner in one year, that guy who has, had already married me. And then, and then they're like, okay, so you find that the, the, the rush to get married on itself becomes a problem because now it's as if now it's, it's a race on who should get married first or should, or, or, or who should marry you first, you know, like, okay, the guy is serious, wants to marry me in three months or four months because he knows what he wants. You find people in, in their marriages saying, love won captions and three years down the line, they are divorced because it is now the rush of like, who's going to get married first. And quickly, as if getting married mm -hmm. quickly is, 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 is reason enough to believe that that marriage was supposed to work out because the person knew what they want. Whereas we are realizing now from what our brother is telling us that, listen, do not rush it. Take your time and investigate and understand your person. And I'm going to resonate with him and also bring in Ellen White, where she says that, um, where she says that, um, um, investigate right investigate closely the character development of the person that you want to marry because you will be this be with this person forever do not just rush because yellow bone and everything you forget about everything else you get in there and then they really mess you up yeah so that that will be me i will say the most after after since yeah. All right, thanks, man. I appreciate. Listen up. We're ending up. Um, I think Takalana can't see your hand anymore. Ashley, you got a voice note from Mr. Kwebu, and the one from Miss Miso already alluded to that because Miso sent it to me. Takalana, your hand is up. Ashley, you're gonna come through. Solani, the deliverables. But before you give the deliverables, I will advertise next week's program. A lot of things happen on the platform. Uh, can we have part two? Can we have part two? We have part two, but from a woman's perspective. Next week, Usis Busi is already here on the platform and she is ready to go. She's going to talk us through love, marriage, and divorce, a woman's perspective. Today, it was a man's perspective. And what a perspective we had from that aspect. Takalani. Thanks, Mta. It's just a comment. Um, I just want to thank uh, Zolani. I am somebody who always believed that I cannot get any marriage counseling from somebody who is divorced. But today he has really opened my eyes and uh, made me have a different perspective. It's just a comment to say thank you, Zolani. Thanks. Thanks, Takalani. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> you are so SDA. <laughs> All right. All right. Ashley, I'll give you the chance. Ashley, you're written single and divorced. I'm trying to look for you here. Ashley, have you changed your name now? Uh, actually, they have found you, okay? Keep changing names. And then after this, I'll do the announcement for next week. Zolani takes us through and cut it off. Now, we've been talking about what we call the after tears. Zolani is what we call the after tears, which is when we've closed the session, when people now start, start talking within themselves. It can go on for a long time. You don't necessarily need to be there, but it's just an interesting part of all. Today, there's football, so someone to go and watch football. So probably an hour of after tears would be okay. My ash, my ash. Sure, boy. Yeah, but why are you saying I'm single and divorced? Don't tell it doesn't make sense. Firstly, I'm not single. I've never been married. So, yeah, well, my name is Ashley. Uh, Isolani, there's, there's a, it's actually one of the elderly guys that's on the platform, but they can't operate uh, Zoom. So they sent me a voice note. Um, Atiena, marriage is like walking on water. 
uh, and unless we the the, the 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 parties fix their eyes on Jesus, they bound to sink. Uh, and he says that he appreciates the presentation, uh, and he just, however, just wants to, uh, in addition to what you've said, uh, put more weight uh, on God's love for marriages, and that God does indeed uh, despise uh, a divorce, and that you know more people on the platform should be encouraged. Uh, to marry and remain married. I think you've uh, you've touched on that. You've actually been very, very clear that you're not here to tell people uh, to divorce. Uh, and he's just saying to those that want to get married, uh, please ensure that you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ because just like Peter, uh, you may start off fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ. And then when you think you've got this and you are seemingly walking on water, the moment that your eyes move away from the Messiah, you are definitely going to sink and sinking is guaranteed. I see that a pros camera just came on. Brothers, I hope you are noticing. Uh, now it's off. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Ash. Trust Ashley to do that. Thank you, boy. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Okay, let me give the announcement that what's happening next week. going to be beautiful. What's happening next week? Listen, I just got a text right now. Somebody says to me, one of my friends says, I'm your new recruit, as in like our new recruit, and I'll join your next Zoom. Then she says, I'm joining in for OBC, which is next week. And then she says, can I invite my friends? I'm going to give an emphatic, yes, please. By all means, can we all invite our friends to come through when we suspect, just like some of you guys did today, to invite your friends who came through the Facebook family, still the numbers are still big. Thank you so much. Invite as many people as is possible. Try to get into the platform a bit earlier. We started off with Zulani at half past one. Two minutes later, there were about four or five people. By 25 past two, the platform was full. Those use rain usually are kicked out first because network really messes them up wherever they are. But still, either way, they, they, they come early, pull through, and we'll take it up from there. Okay, here's what's happening next week. So I'm sharing the screen there. Since we'll see, we'll see is already here. We'll see Mohapi is there to talk to us about love, marriage, and divorce. And again, like what you Alani was saying, can't take advice from a person who is divorced. We'll see is also a divorcee, and she will tell us through what the story and what, what happened with her. Probably most importantly, what she learned from uh, all that. But this time, zeroing into a woman's perspective. Then maybe the next thing that I need to talk about quickly is this one: airtime contributions. Please, by all means, family, we are looking for airtime contributions. If you do want to contribute, please do contact me now. Um, Tandazo or Ashley, the one who was giving out the, the, the comments there. Um, you can send money to me or uh, whatever, and then we send it out to people. On average, about a typical day, we get about 10, 15 people asking us for airtime that amounts to almost 450 rands or 500 rands a typical Sabbath. Uh, so please do help us if you can. We really appreciate it. Then just also 9.30, which is half past nine next week, we're having our Sabbath school lesson on the same platform. You use the same link all the time. You use the same Facebook link all the time. Zoom link, Facebook link is always the same all the time. So you need not keep it. Put it on your notepad or whatever. Keep it there so that you can just, you know, come through uh, using it all the time. We are super grateful to the Northern Conference DASA chapter. They are the ones, if you see the name that's written, my name here, is written Northern Conference DASA chapter. We are super grateful to this team because they are sponsoring this Zoom platform. Very grateful for what they're doing. God bless you abundantly more. Zolani, it's you now, my man. Take us through with deliverables, then we end our lesson as God wills. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks very much. I really appreciate this. I mean, this was a great session. I was a bit nervous because I, uh, there was one question that came through there that like, I was like, oh no. Here we go. <laughs> All my fears are now packaged oh, in this yeah. question. <laughs> but it's exciting, man. I think I think um, I speak a lot about about about. Uh, it's not my first rodeo where I, I get to come into a public platform and talk about it. And I think you can never really prepare for something like this. And you know, it's just unfortunate that we couldn't be in one room. To actually unpack all these, all these, all these, all these uh, ideas. Again, I'll repeat: I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not a professional. I'm just a guy with a particular story. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's something that for me, 
everybody's got a story and everybody's got the right to tell their story from their perspective. This is my truth. Um, and this is just taking it from, from here going forward. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for marriage right now. I'm a huge advocate to get relationships right. I'm a huge advocate for, for the church in terms of believing that the church is the right church, that, we, that Christ is coming back to take us um, to heaven. I'm a huge advocate of our belief system. And I think for me coming out today was not, and that's why I, I, I took the direction of, of not wanting to, to lay the blame on, 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 on my ex-partner. It's more of saying, what did I do to, to contribute to that factor? I'll continue to take accountability for any decisions that I make in life uh, beyond relationships. But I think someone asked me the question is, what's the marriage tip? The marriage tip is you have to, if you're already in it, you have to invest a lot of time in, in understanding what you're bringing to the table and how, you, how you're adding value to the next person. Um, a lot of us get caught up in, in ourselves. And, and that's why I, I talk about preparation so much because marriage is not about you. <laughs> it's about us. And the us matters more than your own individual aspirations. It's about carrying each other beyond the winning line. It's about making sure that you cross over to the other side. It's about preparing each other for heaven. It's about making sure that as you walk this life, you sharpen each other. As the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. And, and if you hold that concept together, that marriage is more than just us coming to witness, it's a literal partnership. And that partnership is about making you better and the other person better. And if you constantly, if you constantly hold that, that in mind, that you're here to, to, to better the life of someone else and vice versa, your marriage will be sustainable over time. And you, you protect it and, and, and make sure that you guard it with your entire life. And, and I think you, you'll be fine. And those are all concepts that I will, when I look back, I was too young to understand them. Am I ready now? Definitely. I mean, you know, if, if I had enough money, I'd, I'd get married like in, in the next three months, you know, I'd do it again. If everything happened equally, I'd, I'd make the same decision that I made, you know, I'd, I'd get married again within a heartbeat. It's just unfortunate that right now I'm in a different space, I'm in a different time and it will come. It will come and, and hopefully, until you get an invite, uh, we don't know, you know, uh, but, but I'm a huge advocate. I'm a huge advocate for love. I'm a huge advocate of, of marriages and they just need to make sense. We need to enter them unselfishly and we need to make sure that we're building the society through healthy homes. As I said, I come from a very stable relationship through my parents. I'm not one person that can ever complain about having issues emotionally, you know? So it's, 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 it's really great being in China. I really appreciate it. And, and I think, you know, if we can unpack this discussion further, let's do it again next week with the next speaker and hear what she's got to say from a woman's perspective and how she's surviving. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Yeah, definitely, man. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your maturity. I appreciate your spirituality. I appreciate your time as well that you came through. Also, want to give a word of thanks to the team that we work with. I may look, I may the, the, be the face of the, the campaign today, but we've got many people that we work with. Ashley, um, Corsi, um, Melissa, Lisa. We've got Uno Makariso. Um, we've got Ulianda. So those are the guys that we work with. Thank you so much, team, for making this possible. But here's who we thank so much, our Father in heaven, who always wants the best for us who has our best interest at heart. And whatever you're going through, whether it be divorce, whether it be a relationship not going too well, whether it be you wanting to try a relationship, wanting to try to get married, whatever the case could be, we are really saying God can help you. Let's pray for each other. Let's be honest with each other. Let's try what we can. It is a privilege that we as a church can sit down and have such discussions. I think it's only in the long run of life that you look back and look at to how much privilege we've been to sit down and be able to talk about such critical issues that affect us. And thank God for people like Zolani Bus is coming in next week. The other week is going to be Uru Mamno Kanyo talking about submission in marriage, modern trends, and the biblical narrative. And the other speakers as well that will come through. God bless you all. Let's have a word of prayer. I think that's what's very important right now. Let's talk to our Father in heaven. Let's ask our Lord Jesus to come through to us and help us in our situations. Um, your social life was specifically zeroing in into social life. So I'm going to pick someone and you're not going to pray for food or that we get money or that we, 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 we find jobs. No, you're praying for Ujolo. That's, they say, tell our father, we're going to Ujolo problems. 
Tell him we need help. That's what we're praying for. We're praying for Mcholo. People going through tough times. People going through uh, the most difficult of times. We're praying for that. People contemplating marriage, pre counseling, pre marital counseling, everything like that. Let's pray for that. So I'm gonna ask one of our elders here um, to actually pray for us here. And I'm just gonna just unmute our elder here, and I'm hoping that the elder, to the position way, uh, they can pray for us here. Oh, where's my elder? Oh, I can't find the elder anymore. Maybe the elder's gone. All right, let me just do this. Ruth, okay, Ruth, uh, Ruth uh, Zenume, you're there. Mrs. Uh, Ruth Zenume, I know you're with your husband right now. And, and I'm going to just ask you to pray, okay? Um, I see there's a hand from UCSP. I'm not so sure if that's a mistake. Or, or, or Let me just uh, quickly unmute UCSP quickly. Um, Ruth, prepare to pray for us. You know what you're going to pray for, right? The things that we go through. Sispi? Was that a mistake? I think that was a mistake. I can't hear Sispi anymore. All right. Let me just close that down. Ruth, there you are. I'm unmuting you. Pray for us. Pray for us. All right. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace, thanking you for the gift of life. And thanking you that uh, we can still be in a position to have these conversations, to talk about marriage, a beautiful institution which you, God, created. Thank you, Lord, that we are in a position to speak and try and learn from each other. Let these conversations that we have had be of no avail. But may it speak to some marriages, may it speak even to individuals that are contemplating on marriage. May they come out of this discussion remembering that you, O oh God, you are the sustainer of any marriage. There is nothing that we can do on our own, except you, Lord, build the house. The builders build it in vain. Build our marriages for our young people. Help them as they go, as they search for the right partner for them, Lord. You know their desires. You know what they want in their lives. Attend unto their needs. Meet them at their point of needs. Not forgetting those who are going through difficult challenges in their marriage. Lord, we are praying in a special way that you meet them. You are the ones that created this institution. Bring them together. May you help them to make their marriages work, whatever challenges they may be facing. Oh, Lord, we pray entirely as a church, the church all around us. Um, we are first with the pandemic. Even some of us are going through this dreadful uh, COVID-19, Lord, and all those that are affected, we put them in your hands that they may be healed in Jesus' name that you might attend and meet them at their point of needs. We are tired of hearing deaths. We want this thing to go away. Help us so that when this is all and over, we can one day celebrate weddings of even people that are joining into this 2.30 conversation. We know you are able to do it. Be with us now, Lord, even as we close the Sabbath. Be with us for the week ahead leaders and directors for we are praying and asking all this through christ who died for our sins let everyone say amen 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 and amen thank you so much to uh to ruth and her husband who came through for us amen okay so i'm going to close the live stream on facebook but before i do that to the facebook family i had already written a message to say listen up you can come to zoom uh, our numbers are still quite big so i think we can only accommodate 25 people and right now on facebook they are about, okay, fine. I think the Facebook numbers are pretty much okay. All right, so now I'm gonna just uh, quickly um, send the link to Facebook. They have just sent it. And then immediately after that, I'm going to stop the live stream. What's happening now is a free for all session. It's called the after tears. Some call it the after scenes, right? When we are going to talk more about what's been happening right now, our speaker, um, he's free to leave. He can stay if he wants to. It's, I will unmute everyone here on the platform, and then we can start discussing more of those things. It can take 10 minutes, can take 15 minutes. It's also a good time to bond and socialize. You could be looking for a partner. Don't take these things for granted. You are locked down in your house. 
You haven't seen human beings walking in a very long time. So take this opportunity of after tears to meet someone, to talk to someone, to avail yourself, and to be able to talk more about interesting things that we're talking about here. All right, I'm going to stop the live stream on Facebook. Zalani, you've been great, man. God bless you. God bless you on your next relation, on your relationship. God bless your child. God bless your ex-wife. And, and thank you so much. You did well. God bless you abundantly. I'm going to stop the live stream on Facebook now. Facebook family can come back to Zoom.